and welcome back to the Wednesday Club. The Wednesday Club. <laughs> that was the Choir of Angels. Thank you. That is you. Uh, currently. Uh, uh. And on our today's uh, topic, it was a choir of demons. Choir of demons. Well, I was going to say they were welcoming a certain artist, but now I'm not going to because that's sad. Did oh. I? Did I? I ruined everything. Well, actually, mine was kind of dark, so let's go with yours instead. Rewind that. Uh, today, that was a choir of demons. We have uh, a choir of demons celebrating all of the spooky side of comics, in honor of one particular individual, uh, who you may have guessed from this incredible backdrop by Ken Win. Ken Win. Go that way. There we are. Things that is side. our very favorite mock encrusted mockery of a man. Ooh. The Swamp Thing. Some nice little okay. record. Co-created by legendary writer Len Wein and brilliant artist Bernie Wrightson, who, as many of you may have known, uh, passed away after a long illness this weekend. But uh, before that happened, he had quite the amazing career in comics and, and fine art. Uh, so we're going to talk about that and get mm -hmm. into our spooky horror favorites. Uh, this episode... Uh, Brilliantly titled by Talison. Oh, thank you. It's called Vault of Horror. <laughs> because we will look inside for all of the spookiness to be contained in comics. I would say that next to superheroes, horror is probably the, the best represented, like, creative mm -hmm. genre of American comics. It, would it, you say? It weirdly, I'll, say, I'll also say that even Japan does some really good horror comics. I, I only exclude Japan because Japan has tons and tons of flowering genres. Whereas, sure. Like, it's... We, we we only have a couple that we've really gone deep with, mm -hmm. and I, I feel like like one of the reasons like we've talked briefly before about the comic code that came down and squashed all creativity briefly, but the horror comics were a big and by reason. Briefly, he means from 1954 to the 80s when people started publishing like that. About it. <laughs> uh, but the, the the horror comics were a big reason why a lot of that went down because they were dark. They were really dark. Mm -hmm. There was mm -hmm. there was dark. So was the forties and especially fifties horror comics, uh, especially those under the EC banner, one of which was Vault of Horror, mm -hmm. and another of which you may have heard of was called Tales from the Crypt. Tales mm -hmm. from the Crypt. They were anthology titles where people were sort of pushing the envelope of the weird and mysterious. Back when weird meant creepy. Uh, and very uh, creepy. Yeah, sorry. I, I, there's no synonym for scary that you can use that isn't an actual comic book title. So just assume everything is a reference today. So yeah, I have an actual question. How yeah. did the comic book code affect horror comics? It <laughs> destroyed them. Yeah. Because like, I mean, like, because you had like tales of suspense. Like, I know I'm I'm going from what I know of Marvel. You yeah. had tales of suspense. You had uh, aston uh, uh, tales to astonish. Tales to astonish. Uh, you had like all of those. Um, that they were working, you had like Ogo, what was it, Orgo the monster, well, that Jack Kirby, that like all that <laughs> stuff. The monsters like, suddenly become more about like, it's a strange rock creature, mm -hmm. and much less about like, and it drinks the blood of the living. Yeah. There were very specific restrictions on like, on the, the reason code. the zombie that walks like a man is a zombie that walks like a man, uh, I believe, like Simon Garth, he, they had to design him very specifically so that he like was acceptable to the comics code. I think he had to like actually be a living guy because they were specifically prohibited from having zombies or mm -hmm. something. That, that was on the Fact list. Was like, on that, like showing like, the dead was like a big thing. Was on the list of things you could yeah. not do. Yeah. The it, label. So this came down in 1954. Uh, comic books voluntarily adopted the comics code uh, in order to keep their business, their entire industry, from being shut down because they were being dragged in front of the Senate for making kids degenerate, uh, like you do with your pictures. <laughs> and uh, so there was a long list of things that they could no longer do because certainly there were some creative excesses in those EC days. Uh, you can we'll get it. We'll, we're going to do a comics code episode. Oh yeah, um, but like and like those ex and like it, it led to some amazing horror comics. I mean, there's yeah. stuff that was. I mean, that was to be fair, sexually exploitive. It was intended vicious. to shut down like a lot of crime stories, a lot oh, yeah. of horror stories. Those were the sort of primary genres targeted by this ban. Um, and. One thing that you do get what in terms of its effect on horror comics was that what you could publish as comics uh, got to be constrained in terms of darkness and subject matter. And uh, the things that were no longer appropriate to publish as comics did actually find another flowering when we got into the 70s. Uh, speaking of Bernie Wrightson, mm. uh, he was an artist influenced by those early ECs, he often cited, and then who eventually went on to work in uh, the... I found a loophole in the comics code. These aren't comics. They're magazines. magazines. So Wrightson would go on to work uh, on Creepy Magazine. And Eerie, I think he more creepy than Eerie? 
But <laughs> more creepy to, than eerie. That's those a are phrase. two different titles. You're gonna hear today. Once again, they're all titles. <laughs> uh, they were anthology magazines published by Warren Publishing, mm. who you're gonna get back to. I will. Uh, <laughs> uh, but they they provided an outlet for a lot of like Wrightson put a lot of work in there. Richard Corbin put a lot of work in there. They were both strong influences on later creators, uh, such as, for example, a little guy called Guillermo del Toro. Well, he's um, done some stuff, hasn't yeah. he? Yeah, he guy. likes monsters okay. I don't, like, I don't know that I've ever heard of that guy. Yeah, no. Huh. He's, I, <laughs> he I, sounds like an interesting fellow. I feel like I saw a video of him making like making quesadillas or something once, and like that was like a thing. Can I, can is that I a real thing? That is actually, he, Excuse he me, puts, I have to go Google this. I, I, I th is, is he the director who puts a, who puts a, a recipe on every DVD? What? Uh, it sounds, what? Sounds like he could Wait, be. Wait, who was it? I may have I may have totally messed this up. There's some director that it's been years who was like, Chat, like help me. Who does who does a cooking show on every DVD of every movie he puts out randomly. That's um, amazing. That's been like a decade. It'll come to me. Uh, or they, so, the chat room will answer this question. Can I can It probably I, isn't Del Toro now I'm thinking about it. Can I oh, tell well. you a quick uh, This is how bad I am today. Can More I tell coffee. you a quick Del Toro story? That Absolutely. Actually like so uh, Brittany, uh, my wife, my lovely wife, who might be watching, hello, my lovely wife, Brittany, uh, she uh, she got um, tickets to go see Pacific Rim, like one of those like audience mm -hmm. screenings of Pacific Rim, where like the filmmakers are there and everything else, and like we answer questions and say like, here's what we liked, here's what we didn't like, all that stuff. Happens in Los Angeles a lot. So she got tickets to that, and we went to go see that. This is like a month before it comes out. We're excited for it. I walk into the AMC in Burbank, and Guillermo del Toro is with his family at the concession stand. No one is talking to him. No one is around. People are walking by him like, la, 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 I'm going to see a movie. And I'm just like, da, 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 del Toro, del Toro, he's right there. And I was like, I'm not going to, he's with his family. I'm not going to bother the man, but this is awesome that he's right there. And if he wasn't with his family, I would, I would go just say thank you, you know, for Hellboy and like all the Pan's Labyrinth. Like, those are also... Great movie, you know. It's not Del Toro. Now it's killing me. Okay. Yeah. What's yeah. that? It's not Del Toro does the rest of Now it's killing yeah, me. Yeah. It's good. It's like I'm like having back on so Kronos. So as I'm thinking that, his family leaves. And he literally just like leans up against the concession stand and starts drinking a soda. And I'm just like. He's got a thought bubble in his head like, so bored. Wish someone would yeah. talk to me. I was like, well, this is a sign from Jesus. Like, I should go talk to Del Toro now. Uh, and like, Brittany had already gone in to get our seats. And we were there with a couple other friends. So I go over to him. I'm like, excuse me. Uh. Guillermo del Toro, Mr. Del Toro? And he goes, hello, yes. I was like, oh my god, uh, I'm a giant fan of your movies. Like, uh, I'm really excited to see uh, your, your, your upcoming film. Like, we're here for the screening. He goes, oh, I'm excited for you to see this. I'm very excited for this film. And I was like, this is amazing. Like, I'm so excited. And he goes, so what is it that you do? And I go, well, you know, I'm trying to be a screenwriter, you know. And he goes, ah, oh, yes, everyone is trying to be the screenwriter. And like, we laughed about it. And he goes, it is a son of a bitch, huh? <laughs> And I was like, it, yeah, it's, it's pretty tough. It's, it's really tough. And he goes, you spend so many, so many hours, so many days and years writing these scripts, uh, draft after draft, perfecting it and getting it there. And you turn it into your agent and you find out, ah, there's a hundred other movies that are already being made just like it and your work is all to nothing. I was like, that's coming from you. I'm screwed. <laughs> I'm so screwed! But like, it was like, the, he meant it like, he didn't mean it as like, a mean thing or an insult or anything like that. Like, no, good luck, kid. It was just like, two professionals. You got solidarity from Del Toro! And it was just like, we're just, that's the writer, that's the, that's the writer's story. It's the writer fist bump. It's yeah. the writer fist yeah. bump. Like, so, uh, son of a bitch. Son yeah. of a bitch. He goes, there's a son of a bitch. Uh, so then, uh, I don't know why I'm doing that terrible accent. I know. Well, it's his. But, He's got but, a really cute accent. He does. does. So as we were leaving, now everyone's around him. Like, he's got a giant crowd around him. And uh, I'm like, hey, there he is. That's really cool. I got to talk to that guy earlier. And as we're passing by, he reaches up his arm and splits the entire huddle around him and goes, my friend Matthew, come here. Talk to me about my movie. And I was like, huh, 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 huh? And like, he like autographed stuff for us. And he wanted my opinions. He's like, you're a writer. What did you think? And I was like, huh, 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 huh? I was like, I, you know, I loved it. It was great. Like, I had a lot of fun action. I didn't want to like tell him like, you know, like, eh, problematic here and there, you know, like, I was just like freaking I love out. It. I'm not even going to go into that Pacific Rim. I love Pacific Rim. Yeah, I love yeah. Pacific Rim. I'm uh, hateful. But like, I, I basically was like, you know, just told him what I loved about it, what sequences worked. And he was like, I was really trying to do a Western. Did that come across? I was like, absolutely. He's like, I'm glad that this came across to you, Matthew. And I was like, oh, you're my new favorite person. He is, yeah. by all accounts, a, a giant sweetheart. And yeah. 
I, I'm, I'm assuming every shop in Los Angeles. Autograph stuff for us. Oh, yeah. He buys everything, do. but like, yeah, he's he's longtime friend of House of Secrets, uh, with incredible good taste. Everybody make, yeah. Everybody in movies reads comics now. I, well, some of them start like he's one of those guys. Like he was reading those horror magazines. Yeah. He was oh, yeah. reading those anthologies. Out. He was reading like he grew up on this stuff. I have I have a Swamp Thing question for you that you okay. might be able to answer. So we haven't even gotten to. I know this is my the thing that I love Regson for is that like much as we bashed on them not being able to do horror stuff in regular comics, they they found some brilliant ways to do it. Uh, and so do I've, you want to ask the question first? Or you get into it first. Uh, well, I want to. I first want to ask a question that we got from our. Chat. Sure. Great. Yep. Uh, Scorpens asked, what would you recommend for Japanese horror comics? We had mentioned that we earlier. We had no fewer than three different Twitter recs for Junji Ito as soon as we asked what people's favorite horror was. Uh, yeah. If you want to go old school, Rumiko Takahashi, who wrote Inuyasha and Rama One Half and Nudo Seatsura, also did several short form horror anthology books, uh, including Fire Tripper, which is hard to. They're, they're I have single not issues. Read these, and this is uh, 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 Mermaid face. Scar, Mermaid Forest, Fire Horror Stories that are. Terrifying, really good, and really scary, and really sad. And I highly recommend if you can find any of. Uh, it's called the Rumic World series. It was published by Viz in um, 300 BC. Yeah. Um, 1990. They're, they're actually BC. on stone tablets. Yeah. Uh, you have to download. Actually, you have to get the granite to download. It's really, it's really frustrating. But the Junji Ito's works are now more widely available in English uh, than they used to be. Uh, Uzumaki is the title most people recommend first. I have only read a couple pages mm. of it, and they were already terrifying. Parasite, Parasite for body horror. If you're into body horror, um, Jody Hauser is on our chat. Mm. Hey, Jody. She she suggested Attack on Titan. Yeah, yeah. Yep. Yep. Uh, I have not read the manga, but I've watched. The 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 anime? Do you, is it anime or anime? It's uname. Uname? <laughs> Stop trolling him. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, Talison troll me? She doesn't You're know. I've been this is going on for years. He doesn't um, know. Oh, <laughs> abort! Abort! <laughs> It's anime. It's anime, right? Anime. It's animation. Anime. Sorry. Technically, it'd be anime, uh, but anime. we yeah. don't say samurai, so it's anime. okay to just say anime. 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 Yeah. Uh, I've the seen American. anime and I loved it. Uh, and our good, our Matt Mercer is in there. Uh, yeah, our, our friend, friend of the show, Matt Mercer, friend and show, Matt Mercer. and vague friend of the show, Lauren Landa, who's mm -hmm. friend of the show but not friend of the show. She's. She's mostly are we irritated in a fight we with can't her? have. No. She's irritated that we can't. Are we of the show? She's like, are you available for breakfast? I'm like, no, I'm doing Wednesday Club. She's like, son of a bitch. So she's oh. on the show. So it is to be war between us. <laughs> yes. She's a, wonderful, she's a wonderful lady. She is a wonderful I like lady. lady. I like her. But, but I'm my, only being so blessed because I haven't met her yet. I'd probably uh, freak my, out. My, my question on Swamp Thing, though, just, just in this direction, is like, yeah. the original, so like the old school horror books before back in the day were anthologies, but they had like hosts, like Cain and Abel. Yes, okay. So, uh, um, I have to this, point out that Jody Hauser uh, suggested Attack on Titan because she wrote the free comic book day issue. She is biased and also a big fan. Done. Yeah, <laughs> we're in. Good work, Jody. <laughs> it's pretty exciting. They're doing like new anthology type and Attack on Titan stories, and Jody's writing one of them, and she's fine. Uh, okay, <laughs> so I'm also highly biased because I love Jody. Can and Abel. <laughs> I, I still have not met this this Jody. I don't. Oh, I, don't believe we'll I can't wait that. to. Meet, I, I hope I get to meet you, Jody. I, yeah. I've heard nothing but wonderful things about you. May I may I throw before you get into yep. this? Mm. I, uh, my wife would kill me if I did not throw out as a possible horror title. I don't know if you would consider it horror or not, but uh, her favorite manga or ma manga manga manga. I manga. say manga usually. Okay. Yeah. Manga. Her favorite manga is Berserk. Oh yeah. Ah. Good one. So yeah yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she uh, she full on legit loves Berserk. Uh, like it's good, it's good stuff. So it's good I've read stuff. a I've read a couple of them. They are intense. Uh, they are amazing, man, and I haven't even gotten to the good stuff. And it's just like, the oh, truth is that horror manga deserve an episode of their I read own. Read that years like, ago. It's, yeah. It is a we'll, we'll a do we'll do one deep we'll do deep one category um, uh, catalog. Yeah, and I'm, we we'll, we'll we'll pull in some serious people for that. <laughs> we have serious people. We'll just freak ourselves out. We're all good. <laughs> uh, Cain and Abel. But in the Sorry, meantime, so a lot of these old school horror books, and we've talked before about how a lot of old school comics were anthology titles. You didn't necessarily want to take a chance on everything right off. You would have like a rotating spotlight, and then if things took off, you could greenlight their own stuff. And so as a way to tie together, some of those would have hosts. You might be familiar with a certain Crypt Keeper, um, who of course comes from the Tales from the Crypt comics. Uh, mm. And then in the, like, so pre-code is this like 50s and earlier stuff. But after that, the, the sort of second flowering of horror stuff, uh, uh, roughly contemporary with, but a little, maybe a little before the magazines came around. 60s, 70s. Um, you have anthology titles like House of Mystery. And House of Secrets. And House of Secrets. 
uh, a name <laughs> which by incredible coincidence. Yeah, no, no, that's weird. Yeah, <laughs> certain comic book store. I, I don't know. I have no idea. <laughs> Who knew? But, uh, those, those were two houses, uh, two different houses. One, one uh, the, the had Cain and one had Abel. And they were like these pseudo-biblical, where they would just like, Cain would murder Abel randomly, and that mm -hmm. would be kind of the fun. It was like kind of a Punch and Judy vibe. Uh, and they, they would, would host and introduce the stories in their relative anthologies. Yeah, and they had like a library. And if anything, if anyone's seen Dark Place, it's kind of like Dark Place is host kind of gets a vibe of Abel. What? Like Garth in the vault, he's Dark. God oh, kind of yes, angle yes, yes. Is, is kind of is kind of Abel in my mind because he's like, I've got that all is... my stories in my vaults downstairs. Please let your fabulous take you down. And yeah, it's my like the comedy version of <laughs> of Abel. So. So, um, funny story, uh, my, my backwards comic book development, I thought Neil Gaiman made those guys up for years. I did too. Because I, I read Sandman before I read our, I was just, our social I media was, guy, Chris Lockie, who is fantastic and a huge comic book fan, is horrified right now. But it was, it was so, no, what was no, so cool I was, was finding out. I was thinking that. I was just like, wait, is this the same Cain? It's I mean, the I didn't think they made up Cain and Abel. I was clear on the pre-existence of the biblical characters, for the record. <laughs> <laughs> But but no, that was I, I was delighted when I found out that like those were real places and real people in the in like in the comic verse. What I love about comics is that we accidentally say things like I was delighted when I found out those were real people. And what we Shut mean up. is that people wrote comics about them for yes. twenty years before the comics we're thinking of. Yes. <laughs> I'm making fun of you, but I'm also know, completely serious it. right it. now because love. this is what I love about comics. The the internally created realities, which can stretch between different writers and artists and different decades and different takes on things, and these, these like, they can be cumbersome. I know continuity is a problem, and it doesn't actually affect these horror guys that much. No. But, but the beauty of it is when you get moments like that, where you're like, that's real. Well, well, and then the weird thing about about swamp thing with all this. I don't think we actually this. filled in the gaps though. Uh, no, Neil Gaiman used them in Sandman. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry, yes. This is your weekly they reference to Sandman. It will happen again. It will happen every week. Forever. Every week we'll and be talking also, about Sandman. And also, it was probably the the biggest influence, like the first real horror I read. Oh yeah, I was. It was very. It was one of the first I read as well. In um, fact, it was so scary. I put it down for like seven years. God, there were some I good. Tried oh, the when serial, I was 15 and I was not ready. The it was the convention. serial killer convention. The serial convention. I got was too through much. the diner. And I got to the serial oh, the convention, diner. Oh, and it wasn't even oh. that I didn't want to read them. It was that I was like 15, and I was reading these books, and I was like, I'm enjoying this, and I that makes me feel weird. Oh, the diner is the worst I can purple tell story ever. I it oh, yeah oh, yeah. There's oh. there's some stuff I wasn't ready for, and then yeah. I came back to it, and it's my favorite book. So yeah, it's okay to wait. But my my question on Swamp Thing, since we're <laughs> since we're going there, no, this is this is all I knew. This was supposed to be a really long question. <laughs> this is the, this is the first time Swamp Thing and like Swamp Thing was like a weird pop culture phenomenon. Like they made movies and stuff out of Swamp Thing that no oh. one remembers. Swamp Thing was the first time I th I can think of of like a horror anthology book that has a central character where it's not a host. I like was there. I, wasn't, I never made the connection to like, it being an anthology book. It's just that he he happens to travel to different genres. It's like and Highway meet to Heaven. People. It's, it's the same way that Highway to Heaven or like Sliders is kind of an anthology show. Uh -huh. It was like it's like it's a centralized character in the horror anthology of like if like we're no longer hosting the horror we're just walking into it every. You know, day. it's probably a really good transitional document that way uh, from the sort of like s fully serialized horror stories that would come later and and coming literally out of the anthologies because of course the first appearance of Swamp Thing. We're finally getting there. Yes. Uh, was written by <laughs> Very roundabout and drawn by Bernie Wrightson uh, in. A special a book called House of Secrets 92. Uh, we're really obsessed with Swamp Thing at my shop, and again, giant coincidence. Giant coincidence. Huh. Giant coincidence. Well, so uh, much came. So much good has come out of Swamp Thing. Yes. So it was originally a short story in House of Secrets. There are some really adorable. I okay. Full disclosure, I made two long videos all about Swamp Thing for Geek and Sorty Vlogs three and a half years ago. Bless you. Uh, and it's sort of weird and embarrassing to look back at, but I still love everything in them. Uh, and a lot of it is, there's a lot of behind the scenes about the creation of Swamp Thing. Because uh, Len Wein was just sort of like talking to his editor at a party and he was just like spitballing and he was like, what do you got for me? And, and he was just like, and for the love of God, I have no idea where the idea Swamp came from. Thing. Um, and it was funny because the, the name came about because he, he had this germ of an idea for like a murdered scientist. Uh, and then sort of, who, who was sort of 
We'll, we'll get ca- to ca- I was going to say character. We at some point we should do the character elevator pitch, like of just like so that people who haven't oh, read Swamp Thing can at least have like should. an image in their head. Okay. Well, well, in the in yeah. the process of working on it, Len Wein kept calling it that Swamp Thing I'm working on, <laughs> <laughs> and that's literally how they got to the name. Uh, but uh, th- those two had been collaborating on a number of horror shorts, and this one in House of Secrets '92 proved so popular that editor Joe Orlando was like, you gotta do it, this is the, our best-selling book of however much, uh, he's gonna get his own title, and they were like, no, 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 I don't know, and they came up with a new pitch for their, their tale of tragedy and lost love, uh, and that was the original 1972 version of Swamp Thing. So. <laughs> so. <laughs> and and here's the it. deal, because do you so, want, like... I'm learning so much. Well, I love my he, show! I love our show! So I'm good. learning so much! This There's is the a, best! The original short story, they reworked his origin oh. when they decided to give him his own book. And then, they him more hard. than ten years later, <laughs> that origin would be rewritten again by a little guy named Alan Moore. Is he little, though? He's very little. His beard, just, on the other hand, is immense. Oh, okay. His, his beard is what gives him <laughs> probably, his size. Yeah. He, his power it's, comes from his beard. not little at all. I'm just no. using the word little a lot today. Uh, it's called a great voice. <laughs> but for the record, it it's... Alan it's, Moore. I, I called both Moore. Guillermo and Alan Moore little, so we know that I'm not speaking <laughs> little, in, little, in little actual Alan Moore. terms at all. I would watch like the adventures of little Alan Moore, though. Like a little cute Alan No, okay. So here's the thing. The Alan Moore run on Swamp Thing with Stephen Bissett and John Tuttleman... Changed Amaz- comics forever. Amazing. Uh, and the reason I read the Ween Rights and stuff was that I was like, I'm going to read the Alan Moore Swamp thing. I should start at the beginning. So it was sort of this wonderful, pleasant surprise to me to find out that, like, the thing that was getting reinvented was an absolute masterpiece in its own way, mm-hmm. just of a totally different style. So the Ween Rights and Swamp thing is Professor Alec Holland who was working on a secret formula, a bio-restorative formula, uh, that, that was such an interesting clandestine project that the government was like hiding him out so foreign agents couldn't like come steal it. So they put him in this like barn in the middle of the swamp uh, in, I'm gonna say, Louisiana. Louisiana. Yeah, uh, it was, <laughs> Yep. Uh, unfortunately, <laughs> some, some bad dudes found Dr. Alec Holland and his wife, Dr. Linda Holland, uh, and things immediately went very, very wrong. There was a bomb taped, like literally sticks of dynamite taped to the bottom of his desk, if I recall, like mm-hmm. full mm-hmm. on. Mm-hmm. Look under the desk, and there's like, yep, there's a, there's a, some there's sticks a of bomb. dynamite taped to your, taped to your. Yes. Chem so lab. we will. I have a, a tree paper rack. First, I'm going to show off this lovely laboratory that they arrived oh, at. Yeah. Here, well, a clip. Mm-hmm. You're the clip. Yeah, I'm the clip. Oh, I love that light. It's so, it's so, mm-hmm. like, it's his art style to a T. It's everything that's lovely about his art and style. And we, we will get to this in a bit, but, uh... Well, this is that, also... If you have up the laboratory shot from Wright since Frankenstein, did you get that one? Uh, yeah. Yep. We can also say that this is the first issue of this is currently free on Comixology, yes! so you can just click, you can literally click a couple It'll buttons. It'll take some clicking around. You want the 1972 uh, Swamp Thing. They're, I mean, they're, they're pretty much all good, but they're, this uh, is yeah. the one that has the free issue one. It's not I'm a lot of bad swamp thing. if we have the lab. Here's the shot. Yeah, wow, like the, the monitor can't even contain that. <laughs> There's just uh, so much happening. So we haven't gotten there yet, but Wrightson eventually illustrates an edition of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, which belongs in the, if it's not in the Library of Congress, it should be. Um, but we're going to go back to the brilliant comic booky goodness of 1972 and this bomb strapped under the table. Well, there's right. Yeah, there we are. Bomb struck in the thing, and it explodes, and he's on fire, and he goes running into the swamp. But he's coated in all his old, weir- his own weird chemicals. <laughs> so what Dang. goes into the swamp is Dr. Alan Holl- Alec Holland. But what emerges the Something night that after? Something pulls itself upright on unsteady legs, searching its cloudy mind for a fragment of memory, then pauses, studying its gnarled, misshapen hands, examining the clusters of root, the crumbling chunks of moss, and in that frightening, mind-shattering second knows what it has become. Dun, dun, dun. I'm gonna... The weirdest nose in all of comics. I'm gonna read this while doing this. I love it. Okay, and in that frightening mind shattering second, knows what it has become. A muck-encrusted, shambling mockery of life. (laughs) A twisted caricature of humanity that can only be called... Swamp Thing. thing. (laughs) So these issues, and I'm gonna show Uh. off a couple more panels from these first 
10 issues of the 1970s Swamp Thing. I mean, you know, no big thing, right? This is comic book art. No one should take it seriously. It can't have amazing landscapes evocative of poetry and deep meaning and gorgeousness. Uh, there we go. I love this layout here. If you look oh, at the castle. Beautiful. Sorry about the uh, It's post -its. hilarious. More wonderful laboratories. He draws uh, a lot of laboratories and, and libraries. And these, the arrival oh, yeah. of Arcane's Unmen. Wrightson was very good at monsters. Very, very good at monsters. Wrightson was a very, very good at mood and monsters and the human and inhuman coexisting. Uh, they only did 10 issues of this book. It came out every other month, so it was almost two years that Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson worked on this together. Uh, and it has not stopped reverberating through comics since. The book kept going after them to, like, issue 24, I think, yep. in that original run. They're interesting stories, but what you really want is those first ten. Uh, and it reached a whole lot of people. Some of the people it reached were baby Alan Moore. Uh, <laughs> who, and this is my favorite part. Who when was he, nothing but beard when he was born. He was yeah, just beard just, slowly growing a man. and yeah. pacifier. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, the beard slowly grew a man. Yeah, <laughs> This is, unfortunately, I've, I've lost the, like, the, the full text, but there... I can give you the run of the Alan Moore run. Oh, it, it's, what, in the, in the videos that I did on Swamp Thing, there was a, a reprint of the Ween Rights and stuff with an, a 1986 commentary by Alan Moore oh. on how incredibly intimidated he was because he could not possibly live up to these works, which were even better than he remembered them. There is a fantastic story told separately by, uh, I found it in Alan Moore's 1986 uh, column and then in Len Wein's introduction to the reprint of the Alan Moore stuff. They both tell the story of when, uh, I'm skipping forward in time, yeah, but when eventually they are looking, they've, they've brought Swamp Thing back and they need a writer to take over about 20 issues into the new run. Uh, and Len Wein calls up this guy who's been working on 2000 AD who's kind of seems impressive and like maybe he'd be a good fit. Uh, and he calls Alan Moore and Alan Moore hangs up on him. In very Alan Moore fashion. Because he assumed one of his friends was screwing around with him. Because there was just no way that Len Wein, <laughs> co-creator of Swamp Thing, was calling him at his house in England to offer him Swamp Thing. Because Alan Moore had never written a full-length monthly book. Okay, I'm way ahead of myself. Uh, Keep going. This no, is no, you're, you're on. We're on. We're so, on. You're not ahead of yourself. In between, chat, room, chat, chat room's good. Yeah, in between. <laughs> yeah, I'm watching it. We're good. Keep going. And this one, this work reached a lot of people, and one of those other people reached by this work was, I'm gonna do it again. A little guy called Wes Craven, who was like, you know what was yeah. great? Swamp Thing. Someone should make a Swamp Thing movie. Oh man. <laughs> I haven't seen the movie. Oh boy. But the movie is also a huge part of history, both because a lot of people do fondly remember it, yes. uh, and because DC went, oh, we're making a movie out of that book we canceled like seven years ago. We should probably make some more Swamp Thing comics. And that was when they brought, they started the 80s run of Swamp Thing. Uh, was I think that with Pasco, Alan Moore then? No, no, no. Okay. It was oh, with, yeah. uh, I think Martin Pasco wrote the first chunk of those. And they're good, they're interesting stories. Uh, but then... The aforementioned, he was moving on, Len Wein needed somebody to sort of keep the book going from this momentum of like, he's got a movie out, we should probably be doing something. I wonder if there'd be anybody good for this. I'm gonna call Alan Moore. Well, twice. bam. Twice. <laughs> they call yeah. Alan Moore twice. Alan Moore's version is that he just sort of stammered and nearly insulted him out loud, but I'm gonna go with Len Wein's version that he actually hung up on him because it's much funnier. Yeah. yeah. Um, I so, think the truth is probably somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Somewhere in the yeah. middle. Where he probably stammered and said something about how he's an idiot. Uh, like, don't he's insult like, me. There's up, no asshole. way you're Lin yeah, yeah, yeah. hanging up. I like that we went to the classic phone, too, yeah, as opposed to, like, we didn't do that. We didn't do this. Yeah, we didn't click. Thing. It was the thing. Skush. Yep. And then he uh, hit his rotary and called his mom and was like, tell my friends to stop calling me. Yeah, so, so, but in a Northampton accent. Yeah, so which the, I'm not even going to the, the The origin, oh God, the, the origins so changed. So here's the thing. The origin changed. I'm Alan not sure I want to tell them no. the new origin. Because the, it's so good. the first issue of Alan Moore's Run on Swamp Thing, he wraps up all the storylines that had been going for the first, for like, for issues one through 19. So he does 20. And then issue 21 of Swamp Thing, now called Saga of the Swamp Thing, uh, from DC Comics, before Vertigo existed, before Image existed, mm. before our, any of this stuff, is called The Anatomy Lesson. And I think it is one of the 
God, it's so of comic book literature. brilliantly scary. Yeah, you don't. We we can't spoil anything because it's so brilliantly interesting and scary and such an interesting take. It changes the character forever. It does in a great way. Um, it changes his relationship to his thing, wife. He's still the swamp thing. Um, it also this was the run that introduced a little character called the other one of the other great horror um, <laughs> heroes of of comic books, John Constantine. So. Who I will always call Constantine, even though that's wrong. I, I know I go back and forth, but like it's supposed I got, to be Constantine, and none of us no can none ever of us say it's that. Constantine. No, because it's Constantine, the Hellblazer. But he's a he's a side character in Swamp Thing. Uh, I think issue thirty seven. That sounds is about. Where he shows uh, I'm up. saying sure. Um, he, so we're, you're bringing all this up in the chat. We have Umbrasil. Uh, question: What is the origin of the connection between Constantine and Swamp Thing? Literally. John literally was a guest. Like I actually, if I, if I recall the issue, it starts with 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 uh, uh, Swamp Thing buried up to his neck, trapped, and John Constantine smoking a cigarette over him, going, "It's a pleasure to meet you." Basically, I I thought they met in a pub, but that might be. No, a... I think I think that's no, later. I think you're right. I think it starts with John like like <gasps> weirdly capturing him and being a like John just shows up and be and is, and, and is a jerk. John Constantine, by the way, if you saw the TV show, which actually was a very loving rendering, although a little. A little softened for television. I still haven't watched it. It was, it was, it was as good as it was ever going to get, which was pretty damn good. Uh, and the actor portraying him, I think, did a wonderful job. Uh, and he he also guest starred in an Arrow episode, which was surprisingly awesome. Um, yeah, it really was. Constantine, like I know, like teenage boys from my generation, like all like started wearing trench coats and, and smoking silk cut cigarettes because because of this because of he this was t- just so dang cool. He was so dang cool. Smoking is bad. Smoking is bad. Silk writer. cuts especially. Uh, <laughs> but good music, like it was like the, the notion of this guy walking around with enormous amount of taste being an asshole was really pleasing to a lot of and and he's a great character. He's been the original by... instructions to the artist were make him look like Sting. Yes, um, it was. He looks very was. much like Sting. Yeah, was it I, I think it was. or Total Ben or Veach who oh, was the artist on that I first don't appearance? Remember. Okay. I don't have it written but, down either. Sorry, but, guys. Um, but it's a character. It's a horror anthology character where he walks around. He's kind of like a, a black magician who's kind of pissed off one as too many works people. In black magic. Yeah. Oh uh, no, that's a whole. The black magician is a whole other set of books, but. Uh, it, it sort of created that like outcast sorcerer vibe that like mm-hmm. really lent itself to some amazing stories. Uh, they've done the the John Constantine. Uh, um, I'll go Constantine now because it's easier. Uh, the cancer story. He de- he bargains with the devil to cure his lung cancer, which is amazing. Um, I've read only bits and pieces of Hellblazer. I mostly knew him again because I met him in the pages of Sandman. Every 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 serious British writer has, and a few of the serious American ones, has taken a, a stab at Hellblazer for a few issues. Which I I'm gonna stop and, and say that this. So we they've brought Swamp Thing back from the dead hilariously and reinvented him into something new and brilliant. And if you watch my stupid videos, I make a huge I, meal out of the fact that like, see, get it, reinvention, get it, formula, genius, the whole thing, it all works. I legitimately love the new direction that Alan Moore took. Like, mm-hmm. not that I not that I even felt like Swamp Thing needed it, but when Alan Moore like addressed it and what he did with it, I was like, Oh, that's good. He's yeah. just, no wonder Alan you guys will, Alan Moore. It's so yeah. hard talking about a twist without, and then like, Later, Swamp Thing meets Superman, and what is, what is considered to be one of the great Superman stories yeah. of all time. I'm gonna write so that down. In the so meantime, I can read that. the original. So Len it? Wein um, had been editing. Uh, it's one of the annuals, right? It's called. Yeah, it'll come to me. Um, uh, Chat room will answer. Chris, what's does. the name of the Swamp Thing Superman crossover? Gift a uh, gift a. Uh, no. The Red okay. Fever or. Uh, sorry. Like uh, we we will get back to it. It's a fantastic one. The 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 annual also where he teams up with, uh, with Phantom Stranger. Oh, and all, that's one of the all time great stories. And then of course Swamp Thing: The Rite of Spring uh, will be the yeah. creepiest, sexiest, scariest, most wonderful de- exploration of love that you. It's amazing. Will read in comics. <laughs> Uh, in the meantime, the, the book, its original editor, Len Wein, co-creator or something, uh, moved on to other pastures, and a new editor took over right shortly after Alan Moore began, uh, and her name was Karen Berger. And uh, Swamp Thing became a very well-received book. Uh, they slowly started altering the way they were presenting it, 
So this was before there was like a mature reader's line exactly. No one knew quite what to do with it because it was this DC character who had met other superheroes, but it sort of, they wanted to do different things that didn't quite fit in with the rest of the books. So at first they were printing sophisticated suspense at the top. <laughs> I've forgotten um, about that. Which is, a, I think, a <laughs> fantastic way of, like that was what uh -huh. they were doing. They were trying, they, they, were, they were trying to say mature readers. And eventually, uh, during the run of this book, they just went ahead and said, we're going to put like a separate name on this and some of these other titles that we're working on that feel like their own thing, that's separate from what we're doing at the rest of DC Comics. And it was called Vertigo. And uh, if y'all have been watching for a couple weeks, you know that like changed the, the whole day. We're, we're, work, we're working and our way to a long Sandman, talk to Vertigo. Sandman, Hellblazer, every week is Vertigo week. Uh, <laughs> Sandman, Hellblazer ultimately fables why the last man, but like most of the most influential comics of the late 80s and early 90s came out of the, the the vision and leadership of Karen Berger and the incredible talents of the folks doing this. And it all started with one of her first, like her second or third, I think, editing gig Yeah, uh, was was Swamp Thing. And they, they made some dang magic. Our, 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 our running, okay, our running parallel for, for, for Swamp Thing that I really like is it's kind of the Buffy the Vampire Slayer of, horror, of like the modern horror book. And then Hellblazer is the Angel series that kind of was spawned from it. And like, <laughs> and like in some I ways, like in some ways out, out, like outdid it. But in many ways, you know, like it just sort of like then like and then gave birth to all this other shit that's really kind of fantastic. What is Sandman in there? Sandman? Oh, uh, it's the Battlestar Galactica, I suppose. I'm not entirely sure. That's my best. I got nothing. I, I haven't know. thought it through. The metaphor yeah. breaks down. No. Um, I also I want to bring up one of my Swamp Thing favorites, which is a weird one. There was a weird run. Uh, there's some some of my favorite writers have written. So like, I'm, uh, 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 to start did a run that's really good. I would eventually do forty issues, sixty yeah. issues, something. It's, and they're it's across six trade paperbacks. Uh, uh, in the Superman crossover, Superman actually like gets sick. He gets like a he gets uh, infected by like a Kryptonian uh, virus and starts to go nuts and like actually he's like he can't remember who he is and he's starting to become dangerous and having like little fits and so he like drives he like he abandons everything and like drives out down to the south to kind of like just hopefully die in peace. And he can like and like is just burning up with fever and like the Swamp Thing finds like he doesn't even know who he is just this insane man with lasers coming out of his eyes who's just rambling and like heals him. It's really great. It's a great story. I, I, I wrote it down because I saw oh, it right. No, I couldn't oh. find it, but I'm going to go look it up and it's amazing. read yeah. it because it sounds great. But they also did, and like... It's one thing develops a very interesting relationship to nature, and it's sort of a very like ecologically progressive book. Well, uh, and then there was Tefe Holland. Okay, and you have to fill me in here because I never got that far. Tefe Holland, okay. Here's a here's a whole Alan thing. Moore, post Alan uh, Moore, post. I think post. Nancy Collins had written it. About 2000. Uh, yeah. This was about the year 2000. This is what got me into Swamp Thing because I I was like aware of him and kind of thought he was cool, and then this was and this was before it was really like a thing to 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 do these kind of character reboots. Like it was very very rare to like take a. Just just to give why they do this, it's really really hard to get people to read a new book in comics. Like it's almost if you start a new superhero, no one's gonna read it. Which is why, like, they do team books all the time because then there's characters that people know and they kind of like they gravitate toward it and hopefully you can like build up the popularity of like, of like those books. But like, there's a reason there's never even been like like they, they try and do like a rogue comic book and no one's like even that is not enough to, as much as everybody loves Gambit and Rogue, it's it, it's tough to get a new character going. So you can kind of take a title that already has some clout, like you can make a Superman book, and put a new character in Superman for a while. And let them be the lead in the book, and see if people will then follow them out into their own bubble, which is which works really well. Which is why we have like two new Iron Mans right now that yeah. aren't Iron Man. One to of see if anybody, Doctor Doom. Uh, mm -hmm. one of Doctor Doom. So Swamp Thing had a daughter, uh, which is kind of complicated because, and it involves artificial insemination and some very iffy genetics with his wife, and. It's a whole thing. So wait, when you say daughter, do you mean like swamp daughter or human daughter? She is a human girl. Okay. Um, with his wife that he, I don't want to get, I'll get into some of it. He kind of asked John Constantine if he can borrow his body to kind of have normal human sex with his wife and have a daughter. Is that really what happens? That's kind of, like, I'm, I'm fudging it a lot because I'm, it's been a like long time. I feel like that happens to Constantine a lot. He definitely is, like, yeah. he's like the guy who's, like, sting. trouble he'd get into. Sting. It's yeah. like, Sting, I need you to come have sex with my wife, please. This is a, this is, it's very French. Um, but kind of, yeah, it got a little weird. I don't want to get too far into it because I want people to discover it. But, but she was fine, and then one day... She cracked and has these, like, she's kind of half human, half swamp thing. 
So she just ends up kind of this weird mess. There she is. There she is on screen right now, uh, manifesting some swamp powers, and she can just she has all the bioregenerative and kind of falls apart and turns into into like the green powers that her dad has. And she had her own anthology series of just kind of being this half human plant creature who was working as kind of the she was asked by the consciousness of all plants on Earth to be their representative on Earth, because they're like, we need a human to talk to humans, and we're going to pick you. And we're not happy. <laughs> so kind of like a better version of The Happening. I, oh. Oh, shh. Is this where I get cut, killed by Taliesin? Cut, cut. No. <laughs> <laughs> it, Yes, it, it, it's really, it's really cl Don't know The hat. Don't, don't bother. Don't, don't bother. Don't, don't bother. bother. Okay. No, it's, it's a movie. And no. no. Um, nothing. But yes, what? it's... No. It's kind of, it's a fun, like, take on this, like, interesting teenage girl who's just, it's a little punk rock. It's very violent. She finds John eventually, and they have a talk. It's really great. It's it's an amazing... And who wrote this one? I don't remember. Because, because I think I'm it might so, actually me, be Brian K. Vaughn. It feels very Brian... It out. might be Brian K. Vaughn, because it feels very Brian K. Vaughn. Let me throw this out real quick. Oh uh, uh, okay. Jim Jammin' Away says, DC Comics Presents number 85 is a Superman Swamp Thing crossover that you were talking about. Thank, Thank you. you! The Jungle so, Line. Actually, I have What's it right. that? The Jungle Line. The, the jungle, jungle Line? line. Yes, that's the name Lion of it. Lion or Line? Line. Line. All right. It is indeed Brian. Thank you. It is indeed Brian K. Vaughn. I actually, uh, <laughs> so, I'm, yeah. I'm actually here. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put a cover okay. up so also you guys can see. Also went on to see. do some things. Uh, so DC Comics Presents, uh, you might notice, is the kind of title that you can give to books that are anthologies. You can tell lots of different stories in them. She uh, has white it's hair. It's a really good story, y'all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's actually a run I would definitely recommend people checking out because you can kind of start it. Um, suggested for mature readers. You can, can kind I, of start it as it is. Can I throw out this question very quick from uh, Compel Bast? Mm -hmm. Question, yeah. is there a relationship between Poison Ivy and Swamp Thing? What, that's such a good question? That's such a good question. I don't know if anyone has gone there. Well, that seems silly. I don't think there they is. They have to have gone yes, there. Yes, okay, well, one of the things that DC... I mean, they're not, I think not they're like related. Originally. Well, here's the thing. One of the things that, that DC did that was really interesting in the 90s uh, was that they kind of created the notion that there are fundamental uh, natural forces in the universe, and one of them is called the green, and one of them is called the gray. And the green is the, is, is the powers of, 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 of extropy. Of, is, is, the green is the thing that makes life grow, and the gray is, is, is entropy, is the things that, and, and so there are creatures, and there are avatars of the gray on Earth, and there are avatars of the green, like the gray, like Solomon Grundy mm -hmm. is an avatar of the gray. He's all extropy. And he's basically, Solomon Grundy is a Batman villain, who just says Solomon Grundy born on Monday. He was like a guy who died in a swamp, much like Swamp Thing. <laughs> um, but he came out dark and wrong and murders people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he's kind of, he's the avatar of destruction in that end, whereas Swamp, he's kind of the opposite of Swamp Thing, who's that avatar of life. Um, and they do, like Professor, uh, what, what is, what is the, 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 the guy, there was a villain who created Poison Ivy, was also the, the, the man who like helped her create her formula. Who yes, I do not made know. Of wood. She's also know. had a number of origins over the years. Part of it is yeah. that like, Old school poison ivy's relationship to nature itself has sort of changed over time, uh, because she's they, yeah. such an old character. They, they did tie her in though with with, mm -hmm. and they also tied her in with a character named Black Orchid, who's another orchid. orchid. Thank you, Sorry. Black Orchid. No, thank I got you. excited. Uh, who's another Vertigo um, part of that? The green, the, like the green energy uh, group of people who who like protect life on Earth. And, and, and that so, mythology ends up getting uh, added to and and complicated in one of the. So we're gonna get to this. We're getting in a bit. so into DC it. DC has a lot of different like part of the whole deal with comics is you end up reinventing things on a lot of occasions, and sometimes it's great, and sometimes it's less. This great. will literally be next week's show. Uh, <laughs> but one of the better things to happen in uh, the line-wide uh, new beginning that happened for DC in the year 2011 was a new Swamp Thing series that hadn't yeah. been one in a while, uh, written by Scott Snyder. With I think Yannick Paquette. I'm not sure if that was the original artist or if it was somebody else first. Uh, it, was, it was. I think it was. I think it was uh, the, the 52. Like for anything good or ill you can say about it, the, the horror books really did well. So there was a there had been an increasing separation between the Vertigo titles and characters and the regular DC titles and characters since they were doing their own thing. And one of the things that they did in 2011 with this series of new beginnings uh, for everyone in the DC universe was try to reintegrate all of those. Uh, Characters and we can also we'll we'll get for to some of that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but one of the things where it kind of worked uh, and it, uh, another step in the long chain of people being intimidated to take on Swamp Thing because everybody thinks the one before was genius, um, which is just adorable. Uh, 
Scott Snyder ha was stepping into this like extremely famous and well-loved book and adding his own spin, and it actually went really great. Uh, they were also doing, Jeff Lemire was writing an Animal Man book. The, at that the time, Animal Man where they, which they is, invented the red, which yep. was a whole nother. And that's yeah. when they added yeah. the, the red. So I the Swamp Thing is the Avatar that, of the yeah. Green, and Animal Man uh, has another element of the natural world that he is tied to called the red. So these, these mythologies have gotten added to over time. That. The red is so uh, yeah, it's really good. Yeah, Who you was drawing that. I don't know. I, I actually Travis remember Foreman? loving the artwork in that. I think Travel Foreman was the original artist yeah. on that. It's one of my backgrounds on my computer. It pops up as him entering the red. It's so really let me good. throw. Uh, yeah, okay. Lord Entropy says, mm. "Isn't the Florent Florenic Man related to Poison Ivy?" The Florenic Man. That's, that the, that's the guy. They tied the Florenic Man. Clara the yeah. Braid says, "Swamp Thing Woodrow, aka Floronic Man, Poison Ivy, and Black Orchid." Yep. Okay, Jason Woodrow, aka the Floronic Man. This issue uh, early on in the Swamp Thing <laughs> run is one of those things where you're like, "What am I? Re how is this this good?" Um, it. it uh, but what I didn't know is that they tied him in with Poison Ivy. He was. He was one of the. He urged her. He was like in, involved in her research and was like pushing her to like do that. Like he was one of her her mentors, which is why she came out so weird. And they have a very weird relationship that's like not cool. It's very Veronica interesting. Man has a, a, a very interesting... Origin. I think he thinks he's an anti-hero. Yeah, And he we does. might feel differently. Um, but it is a pretty spectacular uh, sort of humans so, versus environment issue uh, early oh, on in Alan Moore's Swamp Thing. Let me, oh. May I ask a, a dumb question? Always. Pretend that I don't know who the Floronic Man is. Ah, what could you I... tell me anything about him? It's really, he's hard, because he's so deep. Um, the Floronic Man is kind of another one of the plant, like he was another scientist. There's a series of scientists who... Mess around with plants. Mess, mess around with plants and try and gain plant powers. And he was one of the earliest ones. He was like a proto-poison ivy. And he got like all woody and kind of weird. And he's... he's yeah, he sort of looks stock-like with bushy... Elements. Up yeah. On oh, he's yeah, up on screen. There you. he is. He is creepy looking. Like, like he's he is like, he is a bad bad night in the and woods. And I think he probably started as sort of your 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 ordinary kind of mad scientist mm -hmm. villain. Um, but then as people sort of took new approaches to things, like I I specifically bonded to the version of him in the Alan Moore Swamp thing where they kind of reinvent him in a more sinister way. Yeah, yeah well, it, Not it, that he wasn't a bad guy. Well, it was, it was one of those things where, like, very much the Swamp Thing kind of had that Captain America vibe in DC where, like, everyone keeps messing up because they're trying to make a super soldier serum, so you mm. get all these really weird, bad attempts to make, to make the Dr. Holland's Swamp Thing formula again, and so you get Poison Ivy and Orchid and, and, and the Floronic Man and all these, like, and they, this is something iffy. they go back and establish in this way that's really cool, even though obviously Poison, Ar Poison Ivy was around long, long before. before there was a Swamp Thing. But we, we go and we stitch her, stitch her mm -hmm. into the whole yeah. thing. The Swamps have a lot of power in DC Comics. DC Comics loves the Swamp, man. Uh, Bad it is things a funny come thing. Alan Moore talks about how intimidated he was, like that, you know, he was writing about Louisiana, a place he had never been to. Mm. Mm -hmm. uh, he was from England. Yeah. Not a lot of down home swampy goodness there. Well, like, even even uh, like Morrison's Seven Soldiers of Victory book starts with the with the mystery men in the in their in their cabin in the swamp, which is very much. Seven Soldiers of Victory. You will love Seven Soldiers of Victory. <laughs> but he he had this whole theory of like some like even architects of the very universe living in a cabin in the in the bayous in the like deep in the bayou uh the the, the oh, what were they they were they were the they were the story tailors and they were they were sewing suits of everybody's desk it was so good oh, it's so awesome. it's so grant morrison yeah. just just yeah okay so in the meantime i'm going to show off Bring a couple more, more stuff of up. the original uh rights and covers just because i grabbed a bunch of stuff from the store and um and they are beautiful I love all these things that you grab from work. <laughs> I bring them back. You, you're a terrible cheater that way. Um, if we can take a, a close-up look before I put these away, before we leave behind the original sort of straightforward. And, and the cool thing is, even in the course of these issues, you hit different classic oh. horror genres. You get like a witch story and like a, a clockwork city kind of deal. Uh, and the kind of mad science-y character, Dr. Arcane, who will oh. become... Very, very important in these later runs. Uh, Such and they, a good they very quickly, in these 10 issues, they sort of lay out a lot of ground that will be uh, retreaded in beautiful, beautiful ways that, for decades to come. Was that Kane on the cover? I don't think so. I think no, this is no, that's the, a demon. the that's this is the Kane. Moore's episode. It looked a little bit like Kane uh, for a moment. Let me rewind this and kind of connect some, some various pieces oh, yeah, that we all talked about it. earlier. Yeah, yeah. 
Guillermo del Toro wrote the uh, first draft and turned in the screenplay for the Justice League Dark film that they're now calling Dark Universe. Mm -hmm. And the reported villain in that is Anton Arcane and the Unmen, which you just mentioned. Mm -hmm. So I'm combining Guillermo del Toro. Oh, yeah. And what you just said about And something Arcane, that I just discovered, and, uh, this another yeah. thing that happened in 2011 when they folded some of these characters closer back in with DC is that they established a team for them and called it Justice League Dark. Mm -hmm. uh, which is an odd idea, but had a bunch of the coolest characters in DC in it. Uh, and there was a recent animated movie, which I've heard is pretty good, but I haven't I've heard it's good, too. I haven't seen it yet. But but that has been introducing a lot of people. To I I, I think I think the, the the horror the horror end of these things is like the next film thing to get like like so th it's a yeah. good way to to still do comic book movies but walk away from the superheroes. Yeah, and, I agree. And I would love to see and I'll and I'll say like going in this direction and going a little bit away from like oh, the, look, we've got a oh there we go we got a clip that's look at clip. that that happened uh -huh. that looks yeah. I should watch that that looks. Oh, that dead man? that's dead yeah. man. That's John Constantine and dead man being all snarky and like, Zatanna back there. Yeah, man. This everybody. Looks, yeah, this looks a lot of <laughs> fantastic characters. Um, so like beyond like the DC level, but like the other thing that that a lot of comic books held on to were the classic monsters. Yeah, we had the I Vampire books uh, mm -hmm. and the I the the I Vampire I what were some of the, they had a whole bunch of I dot dot dot. They're not actually related, I don't think. They're not, but they were like they they like the eye eye monster was kind of a thing though that, that was kind of a a uh, I think they, meta they were brand. probably all doing eye Claudius riffs. Yeah, um, well, and then it it led to the show that we have now, Eye Zombie. And that one's more the like lowercase I like yeah. iPod, but uh, yeah. is is a lovely book which came out of Vertigo. Came out of Vertigo. Mm -hmm. It's one of the and then uh, Tomb of Dracula, of Chris course. Chris Robertson and Mike Allred did Eye Zombie. Mm -hmm. uh, Frankenstein, Agent of Shade. Yeah, both companies have versions of Frankenstein in their universe. Uh, and Dracula. And and I am going to actually circle back now. Uh, mm. So, right in before we leave him behind, I uh, oh, did, yes. like, I'm most attached to his Swamp Thing just because I love them. But he did a lot of great work. He mm -hmm. did Batman the Cult, um, which is finally remembered by many folks. He did apparently a Spider-Man story called Hokey that I have not yes. read. Yes. I have not read it, but I, I, I looked into it a little bit. Uh, again, I was going to read it last night, and then I had a, a sick kitty. But uh, Spider-Man Hookie uh, has a villain in it named Torden Kacker, Kac Kakerlack. <laughs> and their thing, I think Spider-Man ends up in another dimension because Spider-Man. And uh, this entity becomes more and more powerful the more and more you defeat it. So with every oh, personal victory, they come back even stronger and then even stronger. And the artwork for it, again, like I, I was going to throw this into the uh, Dropbox, but the... I didn't meet the timeline. Uh, that's on me, my fault. But uh, it features, it's this very Cthulian, very like Lovecraftian sort of monster. Just to, like, it's very like, sort of like a Shagoth, just like reaching at him and it has more and more creepy mouths on it and it's fighting Spider-Man and just like, well, I've never seen Spider-Man fight a thing like that before. Like, yeah, it was almost, it almost looked like uh, Venom. Like it could have almost been like. Looks like this. Yeah, look at that. Oh wow, look at that. Good God! Thank you. You are you are you are on fire today. Yeah, you're real good. Uh, uh, so Wright's <laughs> also illustrated um, early stuff. Uh, not early stuff, but uh, for Stephen King. Mm -hmm. Yep. You uh, did the stand. Yes, and can't remember. I know we're blanking. Did Wait, did he do mm -hmm. Dark Tower? I don't know, my Stephen King. Don't did he do Dark Tower? Dark. Uh, he didn't eventually. Do, he didn't work on like the comics. They eventually did, but no. It's but just I illustration feel like he work from the did some age. illustration. Yeah, for. That amazing, that amazing Frankenstein. Yes, can we bring Frankenstein back up? Because he just did. Just because it's lovely. It's, Marvel published it, I think, originally, and uh, it was it was not a full comic book. It was just an illustrated oh, edition. Oh, oh, yeah. love it so. Oh. Mary it took, Shelley's Frankenstein. It took seven years for him to complete it. It is. Uh, partially because one of his like, like, and I did a lot of research into this last night because, like, again, Frankenstein is one of my favorite books. Uh, and I was excited to find out he he did this. I didn't. I, I had no idea that Wrightson had done this. But you guys are getting so fancy with this. Look at that. Uh, exactly. Wrightson wanted it to look like it came from like wood carvings and wood blocks. So like he put that much more detail in it yeah. um, to give it that 19th Beautiful. century feel. You can see the commonality between his regular illustrated style and what he was doing there. But you can also see that he had time and and like a, a specific different idea about expressing his sort of compositional skills and his wonderful monster impulses uh, directed through that like woodcut fine art filter to get the unbelievable mm. illustrations of his mm -hmm. Frankenstein. 
which just Google his Frankenstein. They're like the scenes of the, the laboratory, the, the scene I think I posted on Twitter when we were talking about this, uh, the initial moment where Dr. Frankenstein sees his creation, which has pulled back the drapes of the bed uh, and stands revealed before him much to his horror is just incredible. And it looks like I'm just tweeting some weird giant torso, but expand it. It's a <laughs> wonderful woodcut click, Please click yeah. the torso. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. But it, 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 it's interesting, if you start delving into, the, into horror books, especially some of the classic horror books of the 70s, I was like, I was picking up my favorites this week and like, he just worked on all of them. Like, I wasn't <laughs> even looking for him and he was just, he was everywhere. He did everything. It was, I mean, it's, it's, his fingerprints are on every book I love from, of that genre. It's he was just in nuts. Good company. He was, he was accompanied by many other very talented folks. I, ha I had to like specifically find stuff he didn't do. It was like, it, like I, I had to put effort into finding things that I could talk about that were not him. So I know we want to move on. Do you no. want me to ask a few questions? Yes, or? I, I, I feel I, like. Before we leave rights and behind, mm. I, w I do want to add one more thing, which is that if you hadn't had a chance, there's a lot of great uh, articles on him have come up this week, retrospectives on his career. And maybe just as importantly as his enormous talent, a thing that I've enjoyed in the last couple days is the torrent of stories about what a great guy he was. Uh, just as someone with a long impact on the industry who we've recently lost, it's been really nice to read how many people's lives were touched, how many young artists said that he was like kind to them at their first convention and then they were tabling together years later and he just uh, was apparently a good friend to many, many people and loved by many, many people in addition to his enormous talents. Jody, so this Jody is our Hauser moment for says, Bernie Wrightson. Well, it just moved. Well, Jody moved Hauser down. says that she bought a uh, print for him last year and that he was just the most lovely man in person and was very sweet and kind and I to talk to. I never met him. But yeah, so. Thank I'm you, Jody. really glad that happened. <laughs> <laughs> so. You, you were saying people were saying yeah. those yeah, yeah, things, yeah. and yeah. I wanted to throw that out there. I meant that as agreement. I am really excited well, by what, that story. Well, 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 let's, yeah, we, we've been ignoring the chat for, for two. Wait, wait, yes! Wait, wait, uh, like, pull some. Pull some uh, all right, so a uh, question from, uh, again, from Scorpions. Hello, Scorpions. Uh, question, what is your biggest fear in which comic book exploited the hell out of it? Ooh. Ooh. That's fantastic. See, because like my biggest fear is flying. I mm -hmm. don't handle flying well. Mm -hmm. um, I am to a point where I almost refuse to fly without my wife next to me because she calms me down during takeoff and landing. Um, but uh, I don't know that any comic has ever exploited the hell out of it. Yeah. So I'm trying to think of. No, like, my my biggest fear. I'm actually. I, I I won't say my biggest fear on on camera because because I don't want to give people ideas because I'm I'm. I, You're out there enough. I, I'm out there enough, and and on, and honest to God, like I feel bad if I punch somebody. Because I go like, I turn red. Like, I, my, my vision goes red. And I'm like, oh my God, you did a thing that you thought was going to be cute. Now I punched you. And now I feel really shitty. Uh, true story has happened. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, what would, I'm trying to think of the scariest book I ever read. Of like, like the comic book that really. There was a couple tales from the crypt that really, really. There was one where a guy buried his, like, he was like buried his wife up to her neck in the, in the, in the, in the sand and videotaped her drowning so because he was like so angry at her or something like she and her lover like like oh that was in the movie that, well, they, they, but there was there was a comic version of it too and then they came back and killed him and that one was really like waterlogged and drowned and that was one was really dark that sounds horrifying um, yes. that was awful I'm trying to th there was a hmm god I don't know let me think about this this is a fantastic question uh, the diner really the Sandman diner really the Sandman me up. diner left a real impression that 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 horrified <laughs> me um God, let me. Uh, um, I will say uh, chunks of From Hell. From Hell, really, really. I still Alan Moore. From Hell. Yeah, Alan Moore's From too. Hell is a is a a really. It's got a. I actually have a. I brought a thing. Uh, there it is. Just so you can kind of see the art. From Hell, they made a movie. Uh, yeah, there we go. Although this is actually, I think this is classical art. There, not really a. Maybe I'll flip one. Uh, this is actually art from the era, but this is. There we go. There's like the actual. Eddie Campbell? Um, Eddie Campbell stuff, which is really penciled and very loose. From Hell From Hell is a really interesting book. I don't recommend seeing the movie. I know that there is a movie. <laughs> Ignore it. It has nothing to do with the book at all. And it's kind of an interest it's a very interesting What's weird. From Hell? From Hell is a book about the uh, Jack the Ripper killings of the nineteenth century. 
and kind of Alan Moore's attempt to, to take a painstaking amount of research as to the look and feel of London at that time and specifically of the Whitechapel neighborhood and the events and people involved and kind of stringing a narrative that is more or less functional. Like that's the impressive thing about the book is that is that if you get the big graphic novel, there are about 30 pages of, of panel by panel liner notes where they talk about how they figured out this is what would have been visible in that scene, the interiors of buildings, the fact that these t two characters did have a conversation at that moment. It was, it was a painstakingly researched piece of historical fiction, but then adding on this psychedelic uh, serial killer vibe to it, giving, giving, there's no mystery in the book, it's William Gull. There's no, there's no mystery as to who Jack the Ripper is. You find out in chapter two called William Gull, and he's right there, and they're like, and the whole book is about why he, why he does it and what's going on in his head and sort of this, him as an avatar for like the end of this, this age of man into this age of humanity. It's really interesting, it's dark, it's weird, it's sad, uh, and it doesn't make you feel good. <laughs> let's, let's bounce into some of our other picks, and I wanted to get yeah. into mm -hmm. some of people's uh, recommendations online because yeah. when I, I, you oh. all send us a bunch of great ones, and we're going to get immediately derailed because oh. I have to laugh. Because the first thing that happened uh, <laughs> like when I posted times. my, like, who's, what are your favorite horror books? I have to thank um, you. Is a conversation I had had about one hour previously with Talison. About, about an hour previously. Where about, I was like, yeah, that we is should my favorite talk about book. our other horror things. And he was like, telling me about this book that I had never read. Uh, that was literally the first response from Jeremy Pinkham. <laughs> uh, Wasteland. Uh, As, you were just talking about how hard it is to no find these No one has ever heard. I f I've like found it for sale on Amazon. I'm just like buying single issues because I give I give up. 80s so DC that's... series co-written by Del Close, the influential improv comedy mentor to John Belushi, John Candy, Bill Murray, and many more. Yep. Wait, uh, Del, what? Close Del Close and what? John Ostrander wrote a yep. series uh, for <laughs> DC. It looks what? like a horror anthology. <laughs> It looks like pre-Vertigo because it's suggested for mature readers, but it has the old bullet logo DC. Um, and it's called Wasteland. And uh, yeah, take it away. What was that? It's it's a non-hosted anthology. I love actually I think we have a Wasteland cover in the in the art in the art bin. I gave a Wasteland there, a couple of them maybe. And Jeremy Pickham, this is why I just shouted OMG Talison when you uh, tweeted this. Yeah, because um. like because like this is a book that this is one of the first horror books I read actually, and this had a huge impact on me. It had an impact on me as a writer. Uh, it had a, the the book had so much character. It has a little bit of heavy metal vibe, if you know the heavy metal magazine yeah. of like. Oh, which writes and also contributed to in one of his segments was used in the movie. Yeah, I forgot that in the rundown earlier. Uh, it, it's of course, <laughs> uh, but it's it's a it was it was a horror anthology that really went everywhere. There was no real connection with it. It was just we're going to tell some cool, fun stories and not really. Sometimes they were literally, that story would be the writers in the writer's room talking about the idea, fact that they didn't have a good idea for, for a short for the book. Uh, that got like really psychedelic. There was, Jeremy shares yeah. that there was even a horror parody of, uh, slash tribute to Harvey Picard, legend of independent comics publishing, to his book American Splendor. Yes. Um, where they made it unsettling rather than wacky in tone. Uh, there were, my favorite story from that book was, was one called Fugu, which were a bunch of rich people uh, they, they, these two cops find a dining room full of people who are just dead, just dead at a table. And there was a mushroom that they had cooked. And the, the deal was you eat this mushroom and it's the most pleasurable experience you'll ever have, except it kills you. So these are just like 12 rich people who have paid a fortune to somebody to cook this meal for them, knowing that it's the last thing, that, that they're going to die and this is going to be the last thing. And like why these 12 people decided to end their lives just by like consuming this thing, and they're just these corpses with huge smiles, and it's, oh, it's so dark. Ah. Uh -huh. Well, that sounds terrifying. Yeah, and oh it's just God. like, and like, and like the cops are freaking out, and there's just not just, I'm spoiling it because you're never going to find this book. Uh, and the <laughs> cops I want to go find the it. The cops no, are freaking out, and they're like, and like, who the fuck would do this? Why would anyone, like, what? And like, one of the cops is just picking a piece up quietly, and like, like, ah, oh, it's just, oh, it's so fucked up. It's great. It's so great. Oh, I want to go find this book. Uh, it sounds so good. Yeah, it's got a very heavy metal vibe. It's again, it's 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 the eighties, but it's it's really good. And I and like the thing with horror is no matter what, it's going to be a little salacious and weird and dark and fucked up. And yeah, you can explore a lot of interesting things through horror. Uh, Wasteland. It, you can't find it on. It's 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 unfindable, but it's great. 
Give them time. I, they got to. I keep hoping. Every I, I brought it up at a Vertigo panel once and got laughed at. <laughs> it's like they're like, no, what's wrong with you? <laughs> really? <laughs> so Jose Hojilicious uh, uh, gave a shout out to the Tales from the Crypt, Tales mm. of the Crypt comics. Uh, they said the barbershop had them and it was all they had. Uh, Kathleen Evie gave a pick, which I think Matt is going to get into a little bit. Mm -hmm. Harrow County. Boom. Has been my favorite horror comic I have read in the past year. That's at, at Edie underscore K. What's Harrow County? Because well people done. are flipping out. Edie, well done. Uh, I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm about f maybe halfway through this it. This is volume two. We were uh, out of I'm, one at the I'm show. I'm halfway. I, I'm almost done with volume two. <laughs> uh, I, I, it is so good. I was, re I was rereading what I'd read last night uh, thus far. So I believe that it's uh, about a main character named Emmy, if I, if I remember correctly, and she discovers that she is sort of like the um, rebirth of a witch that had terrorized this tiny village, and everyone in the village was afraid of her, and she didn't know why. And she kind of leaves the village uh, frustrated one day, ends up being kind of followed by a dead boy's skin. Wow. And he becomes kind of like um, her best friend, just the skin. And she eventually, like, it gets a little bit deeper in that. I don't want to say anything beyond that. But she decides, oh, I'm not going to be evil. I'm going to be good. And then the village is like, oh, yay, we can actually, we can use your help then. Because we've got this weird thing living in our barn. We don't know what that is. Can you go? And she's like, yeah, that's a hate. It's a, it's a, it's a ghost. I'll go talk to it. And I'm going to name it it's Priscilla. It's like that. And they're ah! all like, yay! But then, uh, I won't tell you what happens, but it turns out uh, there is another witch who is ill-intended. Are you a good witch or a bad witch? And she comes into town, and that is where I will leave it. But it is, I knew I, would, like, I, knew I liked it early on. But then somewhere around, I want to say issue three or four. Oh, um, the, the artwork is gorgeous. Holy. I don't know who's oh, the, who's wait, the artist. I'm gonna find. I'm Crook, uh, who it's this is a, a dark horse gorgeous. book. It's by gorgeous. the way, yeah. I mean, we're giving a lot of vertigo uh, love, but dark horse. I'm going off vertigo has also soon. been incredible in terms of horror. I'm really bad at this. Because you may know them from this guy's work. Oof, I love Hellboy. Uh, they are the home of Mike Mignola's Hellboy verse. Uh, which includes Hellboy, the BPRD, BPRD, Abe uh, Sapien, Abe Sapien yeah. Witchfinder, a, a, a whole network of different flavors of supernatural and and suspenseful storytelling. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I knew, like, I knew I liked the book from issue one. I was all about it. But then uh, I got to, I brought my copy with me, uh, and my my wife Brittany actually loves the, these comics oh, too. I was like, hey, you should read these. I, I I read them when I was doing the Eisners last year. I had a this was one of the nominated Eisner books, and I was like, I'm, this is a good excuse to go catch up on a lot of this. The, cre stuff. the creepy skins are but, really are really dude, creepy. It's so Holy creepy, cow. right? Let me show you. This <laughs> is where this is where I knew I was hooked. Yep, yep. You went right book. to what I found just now. Um, the ghosts are all on fire. Like the ghosts all come out on fire. And that's when I was like, well, this is a book I'm going to fall in love with because this is an interpretation of ghosts I've never seen. And they immediately look terrifying. And I won't, again, I don't want to tell you anything. If you've read the book, you know why this is awesome. Uh, if you haven't read the book, go find out why it's a book. But look, like there's the skin crawling away. Oh, See, it's so, so good. Yep. It's so creepy, so wonderful. Mm, I okay, love so it. We had so, our, our Harrow County. Our first shout out for Uzumaki came from Ricky Galetti, uh, which is the, that's the Junji Ito book. Uh, Spirals is another name. You I, I actually, I have another Japanese, it occurs to me, I have another, I have a deep cut Japanese manga for those who are like, who are like World wasn't your deep cut? Oh, I can go deeper. Okay. Uh, Not at, surprising. As a goth kid, I was a goth kid growing up. It's this apparently what? thing. Shut the fuck up, both of you. Um, there was a there was a, uh, a manga that I was really into. It was like the gothiest manga that there was called Gekeke no Kitaro. I've heard of uh, that, but I haven't read it. Gekeke no Kitaro is kind of like, it, the notion is it's a dead boy who lives in a cemetery. They've, did, they've done animated versions. They've done live action. It's been going on for 50 is years. Is this Shigeru Mizuki? It's so, yeah, with the little eyeball. His yeah! dad, there's, his, there's nothing left of his dad other than an eyeball. So his dad just sits on his, on his shoulder as like a little eyeball. And all of his friends are ghosts or demons. And like the, the opening theme is this very nice, like, gay, gay. Yik again, I'll guess. And it's like, and the whole song is like, being dead is fun. You don't have to go to school. And it's the creepiest. I have a little statue of it on my desk at home. Uh, Gekeke no Kitaro is like, if you're looking for like spooky, fun kid, kind of kid, like for that kid who's already getting a little weird. If I've got the 
right thing. They're finally putting the guitar books in uh, nice English editions they that are might easy be. to find. Uh, this is if if this is that's, 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 that's my last Japanese uh, uh, Japanese uh, uh, reference right there. They they are finally becoming available. Uh, he did a multi part. History of Modern Japan called Showa. That was where I was like, who is this? This is fantastic. But he also was apparently massively more famous for his sort of folklore stories. And they're, um, they're, they're very, like a lot of Japanese folklore, there's an evil cat. There's like, a, I say evil, there's a cat girl who's like his, his kind of pseudo girlfriend because they're very young and like. Salison, question from Autistic Cosplay. Hi, Autistic hey. Cosplay. <laughs> have you read, have you heard of Mushishi? Of course. Love okay, Mushishi. So there you go. Mushishi. What oh, is Mushishi? Yeah. Uh, it's a, it's a, I, it's a, I don't even want to, I can't do it justice. No, no, I know, it's, it's a, oh god, somebody else can explain it better than me. Mushishi is, is a fabulous, I haven't read the manga, but I know the, uh, there, I believe it's an anime thing for it, but yes, I know Mushishi, uh, it's been so long. I will do it, I will fail because it's been so long since I've dealt with Mushishi. Seb S. Vid says, so I'm looking at a paperback version of Wasteland at my local Target, joke's on you. At your local Target? That's okay, there's another wait, one called Wasteland. wait, ha ha, reverse joke. <laughs> Um, there's an Oni book called Wasteland. Uh, also comes highly recommended, but is a different it's thing. A Just different check wasteland. if it's Del Close and John Ostrander. Um, and if it is, then mock Talison. Mock me then. Yeah. Mock you. Mock you. What? Target's carrying It's been so long now? since I've had to describe Mushishi this is to anyone. I can't even. I can't know. That's like nuts. Um, okay, Ricky Glenning also Mishishi. shouted out, I love horror is subjective, but he also added Arkham Asylum by Grant Morrison. Yes! Arkham is, Arkham, Batman does very horror good horror. Horror of the human mind. And Arkham, and it's also that that artist is a, a, a oh, for, it's that's Tim McKean, isn't it? Dave, yeah, I think it's yeah. McKean. It's amazing. He would go on to do the covers on Sandman, uh, which are pretty iconic in their own right. Get, uh, getting away from DC, I'll also say if if you like that kind of EC nineteen sixties horror vibe, Sabrina the Teenage Witch, ah, and and so. Afterlife, Afterlife with Archie. So speaking of weird twists that comics take over time. Two of the uh, most critically acclaimed and best received comics going right now are the terrifying Archie books. That is a question from uh, Cardinal Cardinal Iron. Does Afterlife of Archie take its horror seriously, or is it more humorous? Uh, it's scary. Yeah. It's just, it actually like if I mean, there's there, an there's, issue of Afterlife with Archie that made both of my coworkers cry. There's 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 nothing funny about Sabrina the Teenage Witch. It's it's, I haven't read Sabrina yet. Whitney Moore really really swears good. by it. Yeah, I, I haven't read it yet. I think either. we have a cover in the in the file. I think I pulled up a Sabrina the Teenage Witch cover just to kind of get the vibe of it because you look at it and you go, oh, that's the book. <laughs> uh, yeah, there's Sabrina. That's, it's great. <laughs> <laughs> Chilling Adventures of Sabrina, as they are calling it. These, these Both of these books have, their only flaw is that they are really inconsistent in their publishing schedule. Who's publishing them? Archie. Oh, it's just Archie Comics. Just straight Archie, up Archie, Archie Comics. Archie Comics, man. Uh, has their own <laughs> line of incredible horror going it, it, they on They right come out now. when they damn well please. Afterlife with Archie is a zombie book uh, that is venturing into some other territory as well, but starts the, out as a zombie the sort Sa of thing. The Sabrina Jughead crossover made me very happy. Um, <laughs> and uh, Chilling Witches of Sabrina is, of course, grounded in that character's tradition of witchcraft, just a much more serious version than we Yeah, seen. and it's set and it's set in the '60s, and it's very oh, there's Sabrina, there's there's Jughead meets Sabrina, which is a really good book that I like. Oh God, it's I'm so I feel weird, weird how much I like Archie with the Archie stuff, and I guess it's not going to be so weird to you guys now because it's the same people in charge who were like, hey, we have an idea for a TV show. What if Archie was Twin Peaks? Which I, I, have, I have not seen it yet, yet but, but I hear uh, really good things. It's, out. it's fun. I'm I, very excited. I was not expecting it to be quite as fun as I'm enjoying it. Like, it's it's it also... Like, oh, that has I, been said about I, pretty much all of the Archie It's also not the books. It's, no, it's, it's, like, it's, it's not. Even, it's not. The, even, the re, re, the, even the new books, it is not taking anything from, from the new books at all. So let me throw this out there uh, yes. real quickly about Archie Afterlife. I've only read the first couple issues of that. I liked it a lot. I just didn't go back to it. Uh, but the question is like, is it seriously more humorous? I think that there is a bit of like irony eh, in the, like, I don't know that that makes it humorous, but there is an irony in like, oh, we're doing a zombie crossover with Archie and now Jughead is a zombie and now we're going like, yes, it gets sad and all that other stuff, but I do think just inherent in the initial concept of it. There's sort of a level of inherent camp. They're, they're yeah, it's a bit, fun. there's an irony and humor to the basic concept, And they're, they're sort of, as illustrated by one of the, the things, everything sort of kicks off at the big Halloween party, uh, to which uh, the characters have shown up in sort of 
meta commentary uh, costumes because I think Betty shows up as a, a nurse, like mm -hmm. a wicked yeah. nurse, mm -hmm. and Veronica shows up as a certain Vampirella. And I'm guessing I need to put down the recommendations because we're about to take a detour. Um, okay. As promised on Facebook so, Live by Talison earlier promised on Facebook today. Live. Okay, we were we were all thirteen year old boys once. Sure, we were. We were we were in our own way. <laughs> I would like to say, and I definitely I'm not going to pretend that I didn't buy Vampirella comics because of the covers. I bought them because of the covers. And they originally started in the Warren Magazine publishing family. They the did. Bringing you eerie and creepy. Uh, we're like, here's the pitch. Vampirella, daughter she's of Dracula. Naked. Yeah, she's. And like by nearly naked, then like it was. She is more nearly naked than like it's like someone figured out a way to like turn Doctor Strange's cloak into a bathing suit mode. Mm -hmm. It is mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. it's intense. Uh, there she is. There. This was like the least lurid cover I could find, <laughs> and I was like going through like what is what is the least lurid Vampirella cover ever, and that would be the one. Um, they were great. The interior art, I, I've got to say, is. Stunning. It is. It is. It is definitely erotic. It is definitely sexually charged. I give it kind of a vibe. If you're a fan of Barbarella, and if you're like, if you're down with that vibe, like it's, there are books where, that are very exploit, uh, exploitive, exploitive, exploitive. exploitive. Um, this one is less so. Like there, there is, there is a trend in there. Especially, I've been going back and reading it, and they're definitely um, lascivious villains, and it's all there's. There's a lot. Of, boy, I shouldn't use that word. It's too big. Lascivious. Um, lascivious is a little too. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a great word. I don't. I don't. I don't. There, see there, the there, there, there's a. There's a lot of we shall punish. We shall punish these evil men for daring to to think about about grabbing boob. Uh, with, but like, it's a good moral tale. But it's definitely like they are aware that she is basically on display at all times, and it's kind of played for what it is. And they're really well written. And they're really scary, and they're really well drawn. And it's, I found out that uh, it, uh, other than just Trina Robbins, who helped create the character, Forrest J. Wait, Ackerman, Trina Robbins helped create Vampirella? Uh, it's according to Wikipedia. Trina Robbins is a comic book historian and old school creator who I completely Or I might be adore. like, I'm going to double check that now because because like because I found Forrest J. Ackerman's name also connected to them. I was like, that's nuts. This is I know very little about Vampirella. Um, um, uh, JJ Dane on the live chat says Vampirella had stories. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, it's like going back now as an adult who can like who can like deal with this now. Yeah, she, not, they're not their still hormones. publishing Vampirella books. Different companies have had her sort of rights over the years. Currently, Yamal she's Yamal, a Yamal says I heard Kiss meets Vampirella number one comes out today. Yep. Is that a thing that's happening? That is a thing that's happening. Well, well and like, should be. there was a new issue of Kiss today. There was a new issue of Vampirella last week. Uh, Paul Cornell has just started on it. There was a six-parter by Kate yep. Left last year where they gave her a new outfit, which I actually quite liked. But they still kept the other outfit as this like cute like well, she wears it at night sometimes. They, they've they've uh -huh. they've they've done a couple different versions of the outfit, and they've done certainly like like much more reasonable versions of the outfit uh, in in various different forms. And yes, uh, Trina Robbins and Forrest J. Ackerman. Forrest J. Ackerman, who's kind of also, like, no one, I couldn't Can really... Can we justify, he's not really, I guess we can't have a comics thing just on Forrest Ackerman. We could. Like, we could. As we said earlier, like, there, I don't think any of us would be here without Forrest Ackerman, because he, like, half-invented fandom. He, he, I mean, like, I think that's actually very fair to say that he is, like, one of the godfathers of fandom. Like, of, like, the notion of being this into something. Yeah, he uh, showed up with... Uh, I, like is known as one of the first cosplayers uh, because he and his oh what was uh, his girlfriend made the costumes they showed up in uh, what they called their futuristic costumes mm -hmm. at one of the very first world science fiction convention in like the late 1930s I think uh Dead, uh, gone, dead and gone now. Bless him. And by by world science fiction convention, we mean probably like two dozen people somewhere in Boston. Sure. Uh, Born 1916. Look up, look, up, look up her name because this is killing me. Uh, um, yeah. She she made the costume. She essentially invented cosplay. But they showed up together like in in sort of uh, outfits that were an homage to a recent science fiction film. Myrtle Douglas. Myrtle. That Myrtle. Was her. Designed yeah. and created by Myrtle Douglas in 1939. They showed up the worst, first world science fiction costume in futuristic costume, yep. is what they called it. And uh, they, they, there are some really adorable photos of this. They both stayed involved in fandom. Uh, Forrest Ackerman would go on to found the magazine Famous Monsters of Filmland, uh, which was also a huge influence on a bunch of these sort of horror creators over time. Uh, and and yeah, he was he was just he was he was also famous for having his home in Los Angeles was one of the first museums of science fiction pop culture, and his home was it was a private collection of costumes and magazine and like like he would take people on tours and it was, I mean it was 
the thing to have happen. Like to be invited to the Ackerman home was was to the point where before he died, they they attempted to photograph it and put out a CD-ROM. A CD-ROM. Wow. Google that if you don't know what a CD-ROM is. <laughs> um, I'm actually gonna like I have a great picture here just to sort of give a give a vibe. Thanks yeah. to I apologize if any of my like calendars go nuts or I get texted while this happens, but. Um, hey, you are there, sure. I, oh, I need to text Talison right now. Yeah, no, Forrest J. Ackerman and like and like his collection was was citywide, world famous. People would come from around the world in the hopes of getting a tour of the Ackerman estate. Uh, Car Carolina Geek says, "Whoa!" Quote: In 1953, he was voted number one fan personality by the members of the World Science Fiction Society, <laughs> a unique Hugo Award never granted to anyone else. Yeah. Dude, dude. So we have a lot. We have a lot that we owe him. We do. Um, but I and I did not know that he was involved I, I, in the creation Vampirella. of Vampirella. Very him. Uh, and it's a great. It's but an like, interesting Don't character. Trina Robbins, who is just a living legend and an amazing historian and comic book creator. I had no idea. Yeah, and, and if you're in the mood for a little more Bar Barbarella fun, like if you saw Barbarella and you're one of those people who are like, I don't want them to remake it, but damn, I wish there was more. Yeah. I can't. Like, Although I can't there personally vouch for the old Umbrella stories because I haven't really read any of yeah, them. But like, there's same. absolutely a place for storytelling. The, the film, that I'm like, is, the film gets the like, vibe pretty solid. Yeah. Though. Okay. Like, like, oh no, the only way through is to remove your garments. <laughs> we know not of your Earth sex culture here. We take pills and join hands. Yeah, there's a lot of that. Wow. Uh, yeah. For the record, like, I, you know, there are things. <laughs> I object to the element of comics where you get into a place where every single woman and every story involving a woman has to be that. But that's never meant to say that you can't tell sexy oh, no. fun stories. Yeah. No, it's... Like, those are different things. Yeah. The idea that everyone's costume should be Vampirella's no. does, is, is stupid. And, and her, it's her, real dumb. Her, her, her but book, the I feel idea, it, like, it, that there's can't, something yeah. wrong with telling sexy fun stories no, it's it's not it's tantalizing and not and, and only occasionally crosses into salacious and it doesn't and it doesn't stay there. If you come at me with some, she wears it because she wants to. I'm gonna give you a serious look because it's like by all means create characters who want to tantalize man, people, I, but don't pretend that you didn't make those decisions. The characters are not sentient. No, and 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 and, <laughs> and boy, I love every one of my cosplay friends who like the first time they picked up Vampirella went challenge fucking accepted. <laughs> You know, I like like I I love like I love challenge accepted, and it's it's a it's a, such an iconic costume in its own way, and I'm so glad they never like I, 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 it's it's of its own time and place beautifully. Speaking uh, of challenge, uh, <laughs> White Wabbit says, "Question: Can Matt pronounce amaranthine oubliette?" So I, I guess I can did. you. I, I guess I did amaranthine oubliette. I don't. I love know a why. good oubliette. Yeah. An oubliette is a good thing. Oubliette is the place at the Ren Fair uh, that I get into the most trouble. We yeah we do uh, not, we do not speak what? of the oubliette. Oh. The oubliette at Ren Fair. It's a it's a it's the bar. At the okay, there's a bar called oubliette. For, yeah. for those of you who don't know what what the Renaissance Southern California Renaissance Fair oubliette is, uh, it is a bar at the Renaissance Fair where they serve the mixed mead drinks and they are dangerous. Bad thing. This is where, like this is where you go to die. Yeah. It is not funny. Yeah. Uh, there, I have, I have seen, I've seen mighty people fall. Which is the mm -hmm. bar where they make you? Like, that's the oblivion. That's the oblivion. Oh, I've been there. <laughs> Yeah, I've been I like there. that. That's as far as we go. Yeah. They make you. That's the oubliette. Yeah. yeah they, they when they finish pouring, you you put your mouth to the cup and you keep drinking. There are and certain they rituals surrounding yeah. the serving of drinks at this place. Oh, yeah. It's, it's rough. a it's a long line and it's well worth it because you only have to wait in line once. It's, it's yeah. If you order two drinks at once, no, Just go you don't home. have to go back. Yeah. Yep. You you lie down and prepare for the for the what? headache that will come. Yep. Uh, oubliette. So uh, <laughs> let me also ask this. Uh, Kaleida Cakes, question, what's the worst horror comic you've ever read? Sorry if this was asked already. Worst. Worst. Like, I, scariest or bad? Well, we can, we can go both, I suppose. Yeah. It's a bad horror. See, the, the problem is, I, we probably can't remember the bad ones, because if you don't yeah. make an impression, you have not done yeah, a I good suppose job that's, with your horror. Yeah, because if you're not scared, horror is hard to do. Horror, like, I know people schlock it all the time, but being genuinely scary is really hard. Yeah. Uh, What's funny is the question earlier about your biggest fears. I immediately flashed to like uh, that it's not horror at all. But when we when I read on on one of our watchers recommendations the recent issue of Green Lanterns where Jessica has the anxiety attack, that was like the first thing that popped mm. into my head because I was like that was a really that good real evocation scary. of a yeah. thing that Happens. does actually terrify yeah. me. Um, 
Although, like, the probably my real answer to that question would be, like, the, the human cruelty stuff in Sandman. Because oh, if you have to God. put a book down for seven years, it probably was pretty scary. There's yeah. some heavy, so, heavy stuff that happened. And for the record, Sandman isn't just horror. It's also fantasy. It's also, it's a million different things. It's just really good at horror. Yeah. It hits, it hits, it, it does it very well. So, uh, Sean Bryan, 318. A lot of these recommendations are very classic American horror Ghosts, zombies, etc. I absolutely love those, but they don't scare me the same way cosmic horror like H.P. Lovecraft does. Do you have any recommendations for those? I actually want to hear this answer too because cosmic, like, I think if so I, I think probably existential horror would probably be what would scare me the most. Like that's one of the reasons I love H.P. Lovecraft the most. So like going back to the question of like what would scare you, what scares you, and I was like flying. I don't know. It's the existential horror, like that sort of like we're all meaningless. Well, there is no God, like that kind of stuff. I'm just like. Mm, I, I don't want to consider that. I, I, That's like, yeah. it's an, an indirect connection because this is more drawing on the sort of the like the symbolism and trappings of Lovecraftian horror, and less the sort of existence. That, like this uses kind of the the monsters and the viewpoint of it, but isn't exactly about existential horror. This is a a, a Brubaker Phillips book that I highly recommend called Fatale, which is about a woman with a unique connection to some of these Lovecraftian. Uh, forces uh, in different eras of time that was really, really lovely, but existential. Well, I mean, like I will say, I think like especially the Alan Moore Swamp thing is is a lot of it's existential lot of the, horror. Uh, it's the question of humanity and like the fight over whether and things have meaning, identity, and uh, and like it, like it, it, it can get very, very heavy in that direction. Um, yeah, I'd also like, ph philosophical horror, uh, existentialism, like that kind of stuff. That's where I'm just like my heart yeah, starts yeah. to beat, you know. The most. I was going to avoid this book this week, but since since they brought it up, uh, Morrison's Animal Man is is the greatest is DC's greatest delving into there is no God we are alone, uh, <laughs> fear fear the world. Mm. Um, it it I, I feel like there's a whole another show I want to do on it, but I'm I'm learning now not to shy away from it just because. For those of you who don't know Morrison's run on Animal Man, Animal Man is a superhero is a named Buddy, Buddy, who's his kind of. He, his power set was that he could gain the powers of any animal he's nearby, but like by powers, like there are birds in the sky, so I can fly. Mm. There's there are lizards, so I can regrow limbs. Like it's really dumb, and Aww. he was this really like over schlocky, hard to write because it's just the power sets too weird and too easy and too well, poorly thought out, and but his other hook was he was the superhero who had a wife and kids and actually mm -hmm. like was like stable and Morrison kind of took him and f for reasons that he gets into later in kind of a very interesting meta text like I kind of wanted to take this character and pull him apart by the you know like literally like pull him apart by this very core until there was nothing left and watch what happens when you torture a fictional character to death mm -hmm. and kind of does. This was also a Vertigo book where Morrison was someone else recruited by Karen Berger yeah. and these guys were all sort of trying to one-up each other in terms of like doing interesting stuff and it worked out and, for them. Yeah, I Animal 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 Man actually ends like, like in, Morrison's done this a couple times since where he's taken characters and like given them enough agency to recognize that that they're not even really people. That they're they're not complex enough to be people, therefore they're they're small, and it's really, and like there are things I don't want to spoil. There there were moments in the, that book that I had to put it down, like the 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 his his he he does he does peyote in in the desert at one point with some friends, and I like things happened in that man does. an animal man, and like the book happens, and at one point I just had to close the book and put it down and walk away. I was so disturbed. Like deeply wow. and fundamentally so, disturbed. I, feel, I gotta, I gotta search my heart because I know I've done that on a couple of occasions, and I should have figured out like the, what are the books that have made me do the, that. The, the, the only, yeah. Game of Thrones, like when I was reading like, the Red Wedding, I was like, I no, and I didn't touch it for like six months. I was like, like I kept going and like telling my my now wife, Brittany, oh my god, this is the greatest book you're gonna love. And then I got to the Red Wedding, I was like, you know what's funny? Mind. I'm done. Game of Thrones, like it was the first wolf that got me. Yeah. Because that was when they broke my expectations of what sort of the rules were. Sure. And so every terrible thing that happened after that, like, the the sort of band-aid was already off because I was like, we're not in the world I'm used to because you wouldn't 
You wouldn't mm-hmm. do that. Mm-hmm. And it was just funny. Like even it's not that I wasn't surprised and and terrified and and traumatized and sad about all of the things that happened after that. But that was the moment where I lost my sense of safety in that world. Yeah, um, yeah, agreed. Mor- 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 I would say Morrison's Animal Man is is the is one of the great early metatextual like we're going to we're going to frighten you on, on uh, that on that cosmic level. I have I'm, not finished the Animal Man run. But one of my favorites. I, it's early on in the in the comic is where he runs into that villain who is combining. Animals. Yeah. Who's that? What do you remember that? I don't remember, name? but I know where you are but in the book. It's, I don't remember yet. It is so creepy because, like, at the end of that particular story, he ends up combining this kind of scientist who's, like, experimenting on animals with a monkey that he'd been experimenting on. And then they all walk, like, the people, like, lab people come in. They're like, who is this guy? And he's like, it's, I'm a, not a monkey. But he can't talk because he's been, com- it's, I was like, ooh, Fitting in, but ooh, like well, really kind of creepy. Yeah. I'm going to slip us yeah. through a couple more of these because there's some fantastic suggestions in here. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, we had a shout out from Andrew Romero. To, it's not a comic, but writes and starts on Stephen King's Cycle of the Werewolf. That was what I was trying to remember. It was think I just heard that. perfect. Um, oh, Michael Connor know. also had a shout out for Spirals uh, by Ido Junji or Uzumaki. Uh, we have Kyle Vaught. Uh, I don't know how to say your last name. Vaught? Uh, V O G T. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah we're we're Kyle. Kyle. Friend, friend of the show, Kyle. <laughs> Uh, Werewolf by Night, Two and Dracula, Swamp Thing, Creepy Magazine. Very good taste. Uh, all, all writes in good stuff. Uh, Kelly Twetton, uh, I'm sorry if it's Twetton, uh, said The Enigma of Amagar Fault by oh. Jimmy Cato, if inspiring nightmares years later, counts as a favorite. It does. Fiona Dunn has a wonderful pick here. Black Hole, the Charles Burns book, uh, is a wild ride, half teen drama, half beautifully inked body horror. Now, this isn't exactly sort of existential, like, meaning of life horror, but it's this very visceral, amazing, like, body horror is the perfect way to express it. Um, it took years for this book to come out. I finally read it a couple years ago in, in a collected edition, which you can get now. Um, but it's some weird stuff happens to a bunch of teenagers. I think it's the late 70s, and it feels very much, it's it's a period piece. And it's it's one of those, like, the fear is partly in the lack of meaning. Why, why is it the 60s and 70s scare us so much? It's this a weird. It's so true, though. There's something yeah. about the 1960s and 70s. There's just a lot of horror that just sits so well there that doesn't. It and doesn't I would say, like, for forward. sort of scary and surreal imagery, along with Charles Burns, you can look at a lot of Dan Close stuff. Uh, his like a uh, velvet glove cast in iron is full of sort of baffling, weird, violent uh, imagery that alternates with sort of peaceful, thoughtful things. Um, but it's got a lot like. This is comics. You can have some crazy, unsettling images in, in, your, in your stories. <laughs> uh, so your red dog said, House of Mystery I read the most, but I read a collection of creepy ones that got me. Mm. Uh, Susie Wetzel had said, I just started Fatel uh, and Lock and Key. And oh! I just fell in love with both. I've got a couple of those So we had a, a shout-out for Fatel, which I, I gave a very brief sort of, it's, the Brubaker and Phillips are fantastic at crime and mystery and mood and period pieces, and they use a lot of that along with their most, like, their their only real, like, horror book is that Fatale, and I highly recommend it. It's self-contained. Uh, there's five paperbacks or I don't know how many hardcovers I make, but it's a limited run. And then this one, which Boom. I've only read the beginning of. This is one of my I've... big blind spots. It is one of the absolute runaway hit horror stories of the last ten years. I think so, yeah. Uh, I can't I actually have, see what we're looking at yet. It's Lock and Key. Oh, Lock, lock and key. key. Okay, you did put Lock and Key up uh, there. Yes. Art by Gabriel Rodriguez. Uh, it's Gabriel, right? Yeah. yeah. And uh, written by a guy who, amazingly enough, like, has this book succeeded without a lot of people actually under knowing who he was at first, mm-hmm. um, which is funny because he's Joe Hill and Stephen King is his dad, and it turns out talent is genetic. Oh. Yeah. Oh well, that helps. We're we're, we're uh, ruined. Uh, I know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I've read, I don't remember the, I know I've read like this first trade and I got into the second one and I remember loving it, but I'm really bad when it comes to remembering. Well, no, that, that's, 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 that's the trouble is so many things. Once you start so getting many... so many things, so like, it was like, I was having that. Oh yeah, I remember. No, I don't remember. I mean, I got some Mushishi. Yeah. After oh, a God. terrible tragedy, a family relocates uh. to a mysterious old house. There's a lot of familiar elements to this story, but the doors in this house lead to a lot of strange and scary places and situations and ideas and conditions. Uh, and it went six volumes. I think there's sort of an epilogue one that just came out uh, that will be added to that, maybe making it seven officially. But it 
Was yeah, just... I'm I'm like I'm refreshing my memory, and it's just like creep. Like we can just sit here and just can watch us creepy, read comic books. Like how uh, creeped out I was. Would by you guys book. tune in if we just read comics for two hours? Mm. That's because we might do that. Yeah. Um, Mr. Nobody, Filthy Obedlam says, uh, gives shout outs to oh. current favorites. Uh, oh, and you even have the icon, Mr. Nobody. Thank you. <laughs> Black <laughs> Monday murders. Clean Room, which is a Gail Simone book, also over in Vertigo, and Injection, which is Warren Ellis. So that's Jonathan Hickman, Gail Simone, Warren Ellis, and I'm so sorry, I try to make a point of always shouting out the artists of things, but I'm not sure off the top of my head I remember no. who the artists are on these. I'm going to get better at it. Uh, Injection, Clean Room, and Black Monday Murders, three very different... Black Mur Monday Murders is like historical fiction horror. It's actually about this sort of, like, weird... Uh, uh, forces manipulating the fate of humanity circa the dawning of the depression. Wait, what is what? Uh, the like the stock market crash. Oh yeah, I just and started crazy, reading that. Like eternal forces that are manipulating and or behind it, it's and the like so sacrifices creepy. that they require of their servants. It's only a couple issues in. It's Jonathan Hickman doing his yeah, human I, brilliance. I just started I, picking it up. Oh. It's really good. It's got I mean, it, and it's, the art is so stark. Um, I it's. Um, I know, it's uh, a brain. Clean Room is by uh, Gail Simone and an artist. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, I haven't had a chance to read this one yet, but it's about like sort of a, a self-help guru with where things get, like people get in terribly bad situations and apparently Astrid from Clean Room is, is uh, according to the internet, super horrifying. Uh, and just like a scary person. Gail, Gail Simone has a really twisted mind yes. and I love it. Um, and she's apparently making really good use of it on the book Clean Room right now. Uh, Injection is a Warren Ellis' book, uh, which I haven't read yet but have heard is fantastic. He's great. He no Love Countess shouts out Uzumaki by Junji Ito mm -hmm. and more of his manga work. Uh, and okay, that's it. That's my like thank you to everybody who sent those fantastic suggestions. And like uh, if, if you're ever really bored, you can always just pick a random classic time. Vertigo book and go nuts. And yeah. like one of them that I was talking about earlier was Grant Morrison's Kid Eternity. Yeah. Because right now they've just rebooted Shade the Changing Man and Shade the Changing Girl, and that's great, and that makes me really ha happy. Kid Eternity was one of those books that I love that was just weird and messed up. The, the notion of the character, and I'll show a little art from this, like this particular run was particularly dark and weird and filled with bloody weirdness. I mean, like you can just pick every random page. It's just made of painted horror. Um... Kid Attorney was a character who had the power to call anybody he wanted to help him do things, whether or not they were historical characters or real people or fictional people. It didn't matter. He could just say Eternity and they would show up so Superman could show up to show him or Sigmund Freud could show up to sh help him oh or George gosh. Washington or, or like, like any, any character or Tom Sawyer. It didn't matter if they were real or not. They would just show up. And they would help him until they died, and then he could never bring them back. <laughs> so, like, he could keep calling them, but if they died while helping him, then they were gone forever. Um, and eventually they got into how and why that worked, and it was kind of a dark, evil layer of, like, what is... It was one of those things that seems cute and fun and, and, and happy, and then he starts to scratch the surface of... Very much like Sandman, that early, like, like wow, it's such a light and wonderful universe... I don't want to see the things that are holding it up because they're really, they must be really dark and awful. And it's, it's really, oh, it's so good. It's so good. I love our show. I, <laughs> I like, I'm the, just like, I'm going to go read all of these tonight. The only other thing I have, I, I grabbed this <laughs> just because we, we've been sort of ignoring the like, yeah, there's a lot of big names in the sort of horror area. Oh, Obviously, that book. Walking Dead is, is, is about never surviving in men's yeah, and humanity demand as much as it is anything else. <gasps> Um, but I'm also going to give a little shout out to Echoes, which is a serial killer story uh, that Joshua Fyakov, uh, who's a buddy, did with Rasan Ekdal, um, which super creeped me out. Good job with that. Uh, and I know we we briefly we, touched we briefly on it, but touched, like, but if you want to you want to give a, a better a better push. Well, for I don't know that I can give much of a better push, but this was one of the first non superhero comics that I ever read was Hellboy, and it was mostly because like I loved. Um, Mignola's art, like one of the first things I ever saw of Mignola was Triumph and Torment, the Doctor Strange story. I was like, mm -hmm. this Mignola guy's gonna catch on someday. And then I was like, wait, he's doing Hellboy. What's this Hellboy book that I've. And I jumped in like about probably like 10 years after he'd started it. Never, like, just hadn't even read well, it with me. But I fell in love with it mostly because, like, if, it's, if it has religion or a cult, I'm on board. Yeah. Like, yeah. Immediately on board. And uh, boy, so, does it have. And, and Nazis. Yeah. Boy, but, like, so many this, Nazis. 
artwork is oh, just it's so it's so it's i mean how like is this like would you say it's like very minimalist like it's, how would you like it's it's min like the colors the colors are very are very tonal like there's there's it's simple to look at there's a lot going on you can follow the panels like super easy, like, and there's always something going on, and this works. Never too busy. Never too busy, and it's, it works a lot with like very dark colors, which which I always uh, enjoy. It's very rich. There's very but. solid inking. Is one of the very solid signature inking. art things that goes with Mignola and the people that he's chosen to add to that world. A lot of yeah. heavy blacks, um, very dynamic compositions. But but like Noir -ish you said, almost, not yeah. too busy. It, it's it's. But like I, the he's so Hellboy like is discovered during World War II, uh, when uh, Rasputin is, is was he he was working with the Nazis, right? They were like, working with the I Nazis. I believe he was working with the Nazis. They were working with the Nazis. Correctly. He's working with the Nazis to summon this great world-ending doom on behalf of the Nazis, uh, and they bring this like tiny little Hellboy, this little bitty devil guy, and they're like he's a child. Uh, the American soldiers come in, kill them all. Uh, one of the uh, scientists takes him home and raises him as his own, and they form the Bureau of uh, BPRD, Paranormal Bureau Research of Research and Development. Wow. Yeah. Uh, around him. Because then they discover there is this creature named Abe Sapien, who is human, Fishy but like and... fish like and hyper intelligent. Um, and he has to have a special breathing apparatus. They eventually also discover. Um, I just remember the I evil, remember the, the evil ghost, clockwork Nazi. The evil clockwork Nazi oh, is one of my favorite things. It's just like the. Yeah. So uh, and then uh, my favorite, I don't remember his name, but one of my favorite things ever in a comic book ever was the ghost who had to be in like a special suit. Yes. Like like the I, diving like it was like the was early like version of the diving like suit, like an early diving bell kind of thing. And I love. I was like, he's a ghost in a suit, and it, he can like escape from the suit and go do. Like, I know they had it in the movie, but like in the comics, it's. Glorious. And speaking of that movie, this brings us right back around to a certain Guillermo del Toro. Del Toro. Hey, uh, I've got a great story about Guillermo yeah. del Toro. <laughs> so, so one of the things that about Hell, if, if you're interested in Hellboy, it's one of those books where I know people who that's the only books they read. Yeah. Or like there are people. If you're there one of those people, people who like I'm not comics people. Oh, but the library of Hellboy. Hellboy. Yeah. It's one of those books that, that like if you're somebody who's only going to glam onto one thing, this might be the one thing you glam onto. Like this might become your your deal. It's got a great vibe. And it's fun. It's really it's pulpy. It's pulpy and fun. While we're still on the subject of Hellboy, we got a question from Fickle Fandoms. Uh, what is strong inking and what is dynamic composition? Okay, so... Good question! I love you for this question. Uh, Thank you for asking it. So how the page is made is we start with somebody goes over in pencil and puts everything down in pencil to sort of put down where all the characters are going to be, how the camera is going to the camera, the panel is going to relate to the viewer. All these things go down, and then someone goes down with a big black pen and they start deciding what lines are going to be prominent. Yeah, most traditional comics were made with a separate. Like even now, when people do the, a lot of things digitally, they'll still talk about penciling and inking because in some cases or a lot of cases, you'll lay out sort of. Uh, your sketched out version, you'll firm up some of those details, and then you'll select which of them you're going to put your black line over. Uh, and it's what we sort of recognize as the comic book style. And they used to be two separate jobs. Mm -hmm. And often still are. And, and, and the inker, in, a, pencil, a pencil or an inker have an interesting relationship in different inkers. There's, there's a lot of people online who have done things where they've taken pencil art from classic artists and given it to 10 different inkers to see mm -hmm. what they do with it. And, and it's, it's different. dramatic changes yeah. depending on what kind of lines they use and how depending heavy they Depending on how deep you get into comics, you, you, you get, like, there are controversial inkers. Because there was a guy who was very famously the guy you went to if you did not have a lot of time. Uh, and he once covered a character's head with a beach ball on a cover because he just did not have time to finish inking it. Uh, and his name was Vince Coletta. And he did a lot of good work, but he was also, you know... Uh, I think they they made a book on him called The Thin Black Line. <laughs> um, which was the, what? like, oh, it's wow. about so Vince good. Coletta and his complicated history as an inker, where, like, it's not that dude's fault if you had 35 seconds to get something, like, inked yeah. and, and... You got but, it done. But, you know, he literally put a beach ball in someone's head once. Do, do or, you want, like, in front of, of some figures at it. This, do, do you want it right or do you want it Wednesday? He was yeah. the, I want it Wednesday. <laughs> done. All right. Uh... But so, yeah, you can see some heavy black line. Well, you can see that like there are whole panels where that are nothing but ink, where they've just taken squares and filled them with black ink. And and there's not a lot of there's no color gradients. All the colors are very very stark in themselves. And so 
the panels themselves by dynamic, we mean that the, like, the actions are very heavy, the characters are, it's funny ooh, there's not a lot of background. Uh, it's just a stark color. They're, they're, they just sort of give you exactly what you need to see and nothing else. These things, it's interesting. This is actually a pretty thin one, but like I, it sort of, it applies to the overall style because they're using a very clear line uh, where, we can go uh, like I'm all of it. There's nice so many other things. Examples here. I was about to um, say, Sandman is made. Sandman is is again heavy inks. Are there. The blacks are very very uh, clear. You get painter painterly styles where they minimize this effect, but it's it's very good, especially for horror books. There's a reason I'm finding a lot of heavy blacks uh, on, on today's pull. These. But like the, that's um, a painted style that doesn't have any inking painted at all. Painted style, so a departure from that. Uh, Model. Or, or if we pull up a Harrow County, there's like that. To say. Harrow County's, while it's a thick black line, it's not heavily inked. Like you can see where, where they like leave a more animated vibe, where where you just have a a line differentiating the character from the background, and everything else is just sort of brushed in. And I will shout out composition wise, uh, something that you'll notice on. I opened to a random page of Hellboy, uh, and found like the action in this panel is very clear. There's movement from one side to the other. Your eye moves in a certain way when you see a panel like this. Uh, it travels down in this direction and focuses in here, and it's sort of, he's a very gifted artist in terms of composing the page and guiding your eye and making sure that there's a lot of visual interest. Uh, and that's sort of... But also, like, a, another part of composition is making sure that the proper amount of visual information is in there. That yeah. was, like, one of the things that made Kirby so good at composition was he could squeeze so much so many characters into one panel give them all like a different plane of existence and all doing like various motions and all of them very like determined like we're, you could see it we're going to do at some point in the near future this is actually one of the shows that I'm developing right now really strongly is a how to read comics episode of the Wednesday club where we're going to actually talk about just cuz I I try to get my mom to read comics all the time when I was young and she was like uh, I mean, like, she was definitely into it, but it was like, there, there were questions that she needed answered that I didn't know how to answer yeah. correctly yet. Well, see, this one has very, it's, Harrow County also uses pretty strong inks. Uh, yeah, well, it's hard. I, I think uh, they alternate <laughs> back and forth depending on the needs of that particular yeah. story beat, you know? So, I know that, uh, I know that we, we have to, we need to start wrapping up. Oh, we need to start so wrapping up because we're running out of time. Yeah. Uh, let me throw out, uh, we, uh, Paper Girls actually gave me nightmares last week. I hadn't had a book do that since uh, uh, Sphere in middle school. That came from uh, nice. Half, that Faring, is Half Faring Circus. The Brian K. Vaughn Cliff Chang book Paper Girls Paper is Girls. going on right now and is absolutely fantastic. Alan, a, yeah, great way Alan to, to Moore do a Stranger Neonomic Things. Alan Moore, Neonomicon, and Grant Morrison, Nameless, are both essential, scary, existential horror. Thank you, yep. Cavill the Raven. Uh, I've actually been meaning to get into the nameless, so maybe you just convinced me to do that. You're my Wednesday club, Cable. <laughs> uh, and uh, Fickle Fandoms once more says, answer to your question, if you do the How to Read a Comic Book episode, it can double as your excuse to just sit there and read comics <laughs> for the entire episode. <laughs> like this. Yeah. Oh, read the comics like this. Yep. yep. Perfect, perfect. Thank you, thank yep. you. Uh, <laughs> so yeah, I have uh, I have guests I want to do for our how to read. I actually yeah. have some friends who like don't read comics. I want to bring them uh, on so that we have like every somebody to ask all the questions we forget. Oh yeah, oh. and uh, uh, Yamo Yamo Yamo, I love you. He uh, they uh, he she they say I see Game of Thrones similar to the Venture Brothers. It's a story about failure. What happens after the rebel knight marries oh. a damsel in distress? If you will make a Venture Brothers reference. I will love you forever. You will. It's so true. it's it's the greatest he owes story me a ever that. told. Uh, uh, so I'm sorry. I, we should tell people about our show oh, next week. Next week, time. yeah, we're out of time. Next week, I think. Are we delving? Are we officially delving into DC next week? Doing Is that it. the vibe? I'm okay. We haven't talked a lot about DC and why it's exciting what they're doing I mean, now. Technically, we've Rebirth. been talking nonstop about Vertigo, but, but, but regular like, DC. Why? Why it's been and why it's been kind of hard on the internet to talk about DC and why a lot of us have been like drifted away and why we're coming back. And what makes DC great versus Marvel? And I think it's time to talk about what makes DC great. Yeah. And I'm delving. And by the way, I don't think we're saying that either one is better than the other, but they both have their strong suits, and we're gonna we're gonna it is, it, that. Is, it is the borscht of superheroes. It's, it's a it's a it's a cold beet suit with sour cream, and damn, I love it. <laughs> um, uh, so DC <laughs> likes to reinvent itself every couple of years or so. So we're gonna go through a bit of that history yes. and look at where things are right now. Uh, and we, I believe we have confirmed, so we will have a guest next week. We will have a guest. Uh, the amazing Ashley Victoria Robinson Yay! is gonna come join us. Uh, who we were as hoping to have As confirmed week, as we can get one week, yeah. Uh, yeah. No. Uh, <laughs> 
we we should have her here to talk some DC Comics with us and uh, look at some crises and some uh, rebirth. Mm -hmm. Like 53 of them, 52 of them. Thank you all many. so much for your suggestions yeah, this you. week. You guys are amazing. Um, we love doing our final show. note, I just found out that Wrightson is his just hands were everywhere. Did you see the the, the little anecdote that Joss Whedon had? No. Where like he saw some concept art come in for the Reavers when he was making either Firefly or Serenity. Uh, Serenity and yeah. he looked at a piece of concept art and he went, Wow, this guy really loves Bernie Wrightson. It was Bernie Wrightson. It was Bernie Wrightson. What? <laughs> Um, oh, thank that's you. amazing. We, there's no limit to what we owe you. Thank you for expanding the landscape of comics, for staking out such wonderful territory for art, and for the most human, inhuman creatures in the history of comics. Thank you for everything you did, Bernie Wrightson. Us? Thanks for watching the Wednesday yeah, Club. Perfectly said. We'll be back next week. Next On Wednesday? Yeah. Probably Wednesday. Probably Wednesday. Yeah. 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 Let's say Wednesday. See you next week on the Wednesday Club. I'm Amy, this is Talison, that's Matt. We never said that this week. Find us on the internet. <laughs> <laughs>